Thanks. Luis, do we have anything to report out of closed session? Uh, no, we don't, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on with, uh, we're gonna go a little out of order because we have a special guest today. We are uh, pleased to have Assemblyman Mark Stone here to give us an update uh, on what's going on in our beautiful state of California. So without further ado, I'd like uh, Assemblyman Mark Stone to please come up and uh, fill us in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to be here, sort of visions of the past with RTC meetings and chambers here and uh, a lot of familiar faces, which is, which is really good. I, I was, in thinking what to say today, I was kind of amused at the paper today, the, the jab at the legislature saying we, we made now surfing a state sport, but we haven't done all of these things. And what's interesting is we really have done all of those things that that individual was complaining about, including making the state sport surfing, which around here was really controversial with the skaters. Surfers loved it, but with the skaters, we uh, <laughs> heard some, some complaints about that and bowlers and, and others. So from the state standpoint, the last couple of years has been really remarkably productive. Part of it is because we've, state revenues are up and, and we have money at the state level. But I also think we've been pretty responsible with how we have spent the money. And even though there were, as we went through our budget process, lots of complaints about the spending, a lot of it's one-time money. A lot of it is also looking at, if it's an ongoing program, what that long-term benefit's going to be, so investments in people and programs, as opposed to just spending money for the sake of spending money. The other thing that's, that I think is remarkable for California is the amount of our reserve. California now has more reserves than 38 states have general fund. So we're pretty healthy from a fiscal standpoint, which has led to, as you can probably imagine, also lots of consternation and, and fights over what we're spending money on or not spending money on, which is sort of what, what brings me here to talk about some of the things that, that we have been successful with and, and are potentially at risk. From a transportation standpoint, we've done with Senate Bill 1, really the biggest infrastructure investment in the state in probably 30 years. And what's remarkable about it is it's ongoing money, it's permanent money that's going to be there for local jurisdictions and the state to meet the, some very significant infrastructure backlogs and needs as we go over time. And the hallmark of getting that piece done, because it was a two-thirds vote, because it is raising taxes. And that two-thirds vote was bipartisan and brought a lot of people together because of what the package offered. And it was not sort of the typical, often when we do two-thirds votes in the legislature, we have to sort of buy those last few votes. And so there's lots of little promises for this and specific projects named here and there. But what SB1 did is it used the existing infrastructure of dispersing money out to the RTPAs like you are across the state and to the state agencies in order to help you meet your obligations of road construction, of transportation, of active transportation, buses, rail, all of the components of transportation, of sort of the future of transportation are accounted for in there. And interestingly enough, there's also a good chunk of money for research. One of the lacks we realized in the way that we'd done transportation funding was the lack of real data collection and research. And so there's a component in SB1 that's going to be very helpful to the state and to, as we try and figure out our transportation network, to, to do the research that's necessary to gather the data to figure out what it is our transportation system needs to look like moving forward. The other piece that's tangential, and I know your role is transportation, but is really important to the transportation question is the housing question. And when the governor came to us a couple years ago asking for us to extend cap and trade, the assembly, which has been working on housing for the full time I've been up there, told the governor, you've really given a short shrift when it comes to the housing question. If we want cap and trade, we want housing. And he said yes, and was good to his word, so we've put some measures forward, we passed some, we've put some measures on the ballot in order to address some of the, the housing need because in this state, and you all know this, that you really can't talk about transportation without housing, nor can you talk about housing without transportation. They, they sort of go one to the other and we have a real sort of disconnect when it comes to where people work 
and where people live. And that's something we really need to figure out in a much more robust and a, and a stronger way. And, and that's why we're trying to, as we push for planning, we're trying to link those two, transit-oriented development, for example, uh, looking at transportation corridors and, and how people move around. The SB1 is a, a gas tax, it's a fuel tax and about 12 cents a gallon on gasoline and that it increased the sales tax on diesel, which at the time it was passed or first it was implemented about a year ago, was about 24 cents a gallon. So it was a big hit on, on diesel. And as we tax through sales tax or a gallonage tax, we, we do recognize that it is a regressive taxing mechanism. And a lot of folks that, that sort of housing and transportation imbalance is because people, a lot of folks who can't afford to live where they work are traveling large distances and they're gonna bear some of the brunt of the tax. But until we can reform the tax system, we're sort of stuck, as you're stuck and local agencies are stuck, with using very few, tool, very few taxing tools, revenue generating tools, in order to meet the broader needs. So we have this. Uh, it, the SB1 has been criticized fairly roundly. Most of the criticize, criticisms that I see being played out in the media and in other campaigns around are really not true. They're throwing very large numbers out of what it's gonna cost the average household. They're talking about how this is just a way of putting money into the general fund coffers, which again, is not true. And that it's really more tailored to, to I'm not sure what, I'm not sure I quite understand all of the arguments. The genesis of SB1 was three years of public hearings, meetings around the state, of a lot of work done to understand where the needs really are and how that money can be best applied, which is how we came to splitting it between state and local jurisdictions, which is how we came to make sure that we were doling it out through the existing mechanisms rather than recreating another one why the focus on transit and other types of alternative transportation, large focus on uh, sort of walking and biking and, and other kinds of, of active transportation that I know are really a part of your plans and, and very valuable to areas like Santa Cruz County. So we built this in, passed it on a bipartisan basis, not a lot of Republican support, but some Republican support. And what's interesting to me now on social media, my colleagues who voted against it are still out there at all the ribbon cuttings for the projects that are being paid for out of SB1. Because politically, they would like to fight it and railed against it, but they also understand the benefit of the money coming into our local jurisdictions. It is also, for the first time, instead of bonding, and we have a couple of bond measures that the legislature put on the ballot, which has been criticized, and it is literally pay as you go, because it's money that's gonna be raised and then spent over time, and it's an ongoing permanent source of funding. And it's also the users of the system are paying for the system. And it also guarantees, and the voters did this, the voters did this back in the 70s that said gas tax revenues cannot be moved to the general fund. And of course, in tough fiscal times, the state government figured out how to borrow, if you will, and you can talk to counties. Counties know what happens when the state borrows from them. They don't always pay it back. And that's always been a struggle. But then in 2010, the voters said, no, you can't borrow transportation monies. And then last June, the voters said, we're gonna put all new transportation revenues by the Constitution into a lockbox so they only can be spent on transportation. So there's no way that the, a future legislature or a future administration could be tempted to take those monies and bring them into the state's general fund. Can't be borrowed can't be swept, can't be stolen, whatever term you want to use, they will be used for transportation. That's really the good news of this system. And I know as I drive around my district, Santa Cruz County, Monterey County, parts of Santa Clara County, I see the signs up all over where SB1 money is now being spent and fixing, addressing the long backlog of transportation projects that have been greatly frustrating to people over the years. And Caltrans, of course, I know is also very happy at that prospect. And, and the conversations that, that we've been having around 
responsibly understanding how roadways interact with the rest of the environment that they weigh in, and I'm talking about the wildlife corridor up here, the, up at Laurel Curve, and there's a large one on 101 that's down in Ventura County, I think it is. We're talking about others that will connect the Santa Cruz Mountains with the Gabilan Range to the south and with the Diablo Range to the east of us, and Caltrans has really been a partner in understanding how to use their advanced mitigation funds and how we've designed sort of the philosophy of, of building roads now into SB1 and into the future so that a roadway, yes, it's to just move vehicles, which is, I know what Caltrans likes to do, but it's also, it sits in our environment and it sits in our communities. And it has to work with all of the above. And so as we design, as we repair, as we rethink, not just transportation corridors or for vehicles, but also transportation corridors for humans and for wildlife and for all the things that make our communities vibrant, this is all now being better taken into account than it had been before. So that's kind of the landscape for, um, from a transportation standpoint. And we're also really looking hard at electric vehicles there's been, there was a bill that did not pass that would, man, would have mandated by, it was either 2030 or 2035, that all new cars be electric. The, in the heavy transportation sector, buses, trucks, a little harder of a calculation because the storage issues and the, the power of electric motors. I know that Santa Cruz Metro is looking at Highway 17 bus being electrified, which I always thought was astonishing because going up that hill, great going down the other side, you recharge the thing all the way to San Jose, but going up the hill is definitely a challenge, but the technology is really growing. And from our standpoint, the more the state can incentivize increase in storage, both in the energy sector, but also the transportation sector, then we help create the markets internationally, because California is such a large market. We help create the markets to drive innovation in the storage side, which we will all see the benefits from, and that's what's going to then allow the heavy transportation sector to ultimately be electrified, which is the goal, as well as private vehicles. And then getting the infrastructure in place to have charging stations wherever people need them looking at fast charging, slow charging, and if we can get that, all of those batteries connected into the, into the energy grid, it's actually very, very beneficial to the energy grid. So, yes, I linked housing and transportation, but energy and transportation are also intricately linked through some of these me mechanisms, and we're trying to make sure we're looking at all of it, the entire map, as we make decisions, which I, I know people don't, quite believe, and we're still struggling with that because we tend to think of transportation in a bucket and housing in a bucket and energy in a bucket, but those buckets all blend if we're smart about how we're designing policy for California in the future. So from a fiscal standpoint, the state's pretty healthy. Hopefully, we'll be able to hold on to the SB1 program and really put that money to good use through you and the RTPAs throughout the state and get some of the infrastructure investment really back on track, but in a way that's not just the way we had always done it, in a way that looks to what transportation needs to look like in California over the next 20, 30, 50 years. So that's sort of where I think we stand. I'm happy to answer questions about that or anything else that's, that's of interest. Of course, in the legislature, we've done lots and lots of things. The governor just got done last Sunday night with a whole raft of bills that he signed, and interestingly signed, when you look at what he vetoed versus what he signed, signed a pretty good percentage of them. But I think over the eight years that the governor was in there, a lot of us learned how to work with him and how to try and engage with some of the policies a little bit earlier with the administration to ensure success so that as we're moving something through, we're working with the stakeholders, but also with the administration so that when we put something on his desk, it has a, a better chance of getting signed and the administration, whichever departments have appropriate buy-in to what it is that we're interested in as well as things that I know uh, this governor has been looking forward to. And just in closing, I will also have to say that California now being on the international stage and especially with climate, when we held the climate summit a couple of years ago, jurisdictions from around the world were here in, in California for California, not 
necessarily for the United States, which is backing away from prior obligations to climate, but California has organized a number of different states, and a lot of those states were represented, and countries from around the world, with a commitment to keeping the temperature growth under two degrees centigrade, with a commitment to decarbonizing their systems, their fuels, their energy sectors, and some real commitments to the, the future of this planet. And for the first time in this conversation, the oceans were put in the climate debate. They had not been in this international forum before, and California, through the Ocean Protection Council, made sure that oceans were a part of it. And when you think about the bigger transportation picture, when you think about sort of the bigger environmental picture, oceans obviously are a very, very critical piece of it. And for those of us who live along the coast, we, we know that, we live that, we have a lot of people coming to the coast to see who we are, what we have, and all of the resources that we have around here. So California's in a pretty strong place, in a leadership place. And all of us, and really all of you, are a, are a part of what makes that system work. So I applaud your willingness to sit on the Regional Transportation Commission. I know it's not always the easiest set of meetings. It can be controversial in this county. But it's very, very important to how this county looks and certainly how this county moves. So I'm happy to take questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, thank you, Senator Stone, for that upbeat uh, presentation about our Golden State. Uh, let's just hope that uh, the voters uh, consider and focus on the benefits when they go to the ballot box of transportation. Indeed. Uh, any questions of the commissioners? One question, Commissioner Bertrand. Mr. Stone, um, in terms of the monies that we've set aside for emergencies, we know that uh, Governor Brown has been very uh, consistent on that in his um, governorship. What kind of protections do we have that, or what kind of limits, or what kind of conditions do we have on dipping into those funds? Well, the, if you, th there are a number of different reserves, if you will. There's the rainy day fund that the voters initiated, and it has some very specific terms to dip into. Most of them are fiscal or financial. But those monies and those reserves, the other reserves that the legislature has created in conjunction with the governor are potentially a little bit more flexible as we dip into them. But a lot of it can be used and will be used in an emergency situation. Uh, we've seen the wildfires across California. Those fairly quickly exhausted the financial capability of the system. But even more startlingly, those fires, we were literally one fire away from having no resources, not money, but men and equipment to go fight them. So we, in a bit of a controversial bill, because it was, it was giving, in my view, a little bit too much to the investor-owned utilities on one end and changing the liability question for them in the way that the system has been set up to protect those who have lost homes, property through the fires. The, the part that was very compelling to me was a real investment in that infrastructure, in pre-positioning equipment, in doing forestry management, and the kinds of things that will reduce the impact of some of the fires that are going to come. We're not going to stop the fires, but we can reduce the impact of the fires. So we've, we've really increased our investment in our ability to respond to the fires. And at the same time, the reserves now give us a buffer in case the, an emergency situation is significant. And that's true whether it's fires or floods pandemics, whatever, we, we have the ability to spend some of these reserves to address whatever the, the issue is, but only as long as we have the reserves. And so those other investments in those systems become important to look at long term, because as the next economy cycle happens and we dip down, the reason for the rainy day fund and those reserves is when we're flush sort of lopping off a little bit of the spending of what we could otherwise spend so that we can fill in the valleys of the next downturn and smooth that out. So for cities and counties and other local agencies, that lack of state money will have less impact, hopefully, if we've, if we've done this well. But in times like this, we also have the ability to address emergency consequences because some of that money is there. But having money and then having other resources like equipment and manpower are often two different things, and we have to be responsible to both. Thank you for that presentation. We appreciate you coming and spend some time with us. So, sure. And, and feel free to come back whenever you feel like it. Happy to be here, and, and good luck with the rest of your meeting and decisions you get to make. Thank you very much. All right.
Okay, we'll get back on track. Uh, we will uh, begin, the, this portion is the oral communications part of the meeting. This is a chance when uh, people of the public are allowed to come up and speak on anything that is not on the agenda. Uh, we'll be trying to move along today. We have a lot on our agenda, so we'll be giving two minutes today for that uh, oral communication. Ms. McNulty. Good morning, everybody. Gail McNulty. Um, Santa Cruz County Greenway. Happy bike to school and work day. Some of you may have ridden your bikes to school today. For those, or to work today. For those of you who don't do this daily, wouldn't it feel great if you did it more often? What if every transportation decision we made in our county had to be fantastic for an eight-year-old and an 80-year-old? Then we'd be planning a county where Ryan and Zach and Patrick's children could, when they get a little bit older, could actually bike or walk to school with their friends every day, like most of us did when we were little, instead of a county where this only happens twice a year. Think about it. There was no such thing as bike to school day when we were kids because every day was bike to school day. My parents never drove me to school. Growing up in the Chicago suburbs, I walked or biked to school every day in the snow, in the rain, and in very hot weather. The reason we celebrate Bike to School Day is because the auto industry has been allowed to dominate our society for so many years, and now we have these. If we were count planning our county for 8 to 80 year olds, then when each of us reach the age of 80, perhaps, uh, and perhaps we shouldn't be driving anymore, we'd have a fabulous system of buses to get us everywhere we need to go when we need to be there. We know that we need change. The people losing hours every day commuting north on, on the highway know that we need change now, not in 20 years. When Jeanette Seda Khan was transportation commissioner in New York City during the Bloomberg administration, she installed New York City's first protected bike lane 30 days, days after the idea first came up. They didn't study, for, study it for a year and they didn't wait for stakeholder buy-in. They simply said, you know what, if it doesn't work, we'll take it out. Change is hard, but change offers wonderful possibilities. Rather than feeling good about things we might achieve in 20 years, what if we were starting to think about things we can make better now? Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Mr. Nelson. Good morning, commissioners uh, and members of the public and RTC staff. Thanks for being here today. My name is Jack Nelson, and I, I listened as you did with great interest to what Assemblymember Stone had to say, and I was uh, not surprised to hear him mention the linkage between transportation and housing, uh, and I was very happy to hear him also mention the linkage between transportation and energy. And um, Mr. Stone presented some optimistic points uh, he didn't mention earlier this year that the California Air Resources Board produced a report on how we're doing on climate emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and California is moving forward in the energy sector in, in the uh, electric grid, but um, it, it's still failing on, trans on the transportation side. Uh, transportation emissions are still growing in California. So that's where um, you commissioners enter the picture, and I'm here once again to um, promote to you the idea that we really need to fix greenhouse gas emissions in our transportation decision making, and the Air Resources Board will tell you uh, where those emissions are coming from. They're coming out the tailpipes of cars, which are the highest energy demand form of transportation. So even if you fix the auto as far as making it electric, you still have a high energy demand way of getting around. Uh, the least energy demand, of course, is, is walking or bicycling. So then we bring in housing. Well, if you can live within bicycling distance, you can ride a bike to work, or maybe you have public transportation that uses less energy per person, and then you ride your bike to the train station or the bus stop, or maybe you, you know, use a shared bike. Uh, so, so there are fixes out there, and they don't involve more cars. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Joe Martinez, and I'm here representing Trail Now. Uh, Trail Now is pleased that the UCIS study is complete 
and Trail Now is looking forward to a transportation, transportation solution today. Uh, we urge you to use caution going forward. Sir, sir, if you want to talk on the Unified Quarter Study, you'll have to wait till that agenda item comes up. This is for items not on the agenda. Okay. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, good morning, Michael Saint with Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. I'm going to have to refer to my papers to try to get this in in two minutes. Um, basically, I just want to implore this commission to try and get away from the thought of widening highways as a solution to our problems. Uh, back in the 50s, the government that we know now went the wrong direction with high-speed auto routes uh, that increased urban sprawl. Uh, as the speed increased on these, so did the sprawl. Um, the um, transit in the U.S. never was uh, giving this a chance to go out there. People in Europe and around the world actually chased the people. We stopped and went entirely with a highway system. Almost every American transit system has had a meltdown as a result of chronic deferred maintenance. And, uh, and this is our own metro system. It's headed down this road. In my uh, studies, I've learned that over 60 of our buses out of the approximately 100 we have are out of time. If we spend state, local funding wisely and focus to get the biggest bang for the buck to reduce congestion, vehicle miles travel, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, focus on safety and eliminating single occupancy vehicles, it becomes a win for everybody. How do we do this? You run buses reasonably often, all day, every day. That has been the proven way around the world to attract riders to transit. It's basically frequency. I was in the airline industry for 41 years, and without frequency, my company would not have been in business. I believe it's worth the investment to make more areas accessible to everyone, to reduce the severe environmental impact of overwhelming dependency on the car. If cities and counties do not support it, the riders will not come. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica Evans, and um, I just wanted to say that um, all problems are local problems, and the problem of transportation is an especially local problem. And um, I'm really happy to see the improvements to bike and pedestrian safety that have happened in the last few years with the green lines, lanes and other kinds of things that make bicycling a little bit more, feel a little bit more comfortable in our local streets and I think that we have a long way to go. I want to point out that Bay Street still doesn't have any bicycle safety improvements despite being a major transportation corridor for pedestrians and bicyclists, for children and students of all ages. I'm a little frustrated that Bay Street is kind of the orphan child of the bicycle safety project in Santa Cruz right now, um, especially at the intersection of Mission where we desperately need more safety improvements for that road. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Pico. Good morning, my name's Kerry Pico. I'm here to actually address what I consider the financial fiduciary responsibility of the RTC and its failure to actually act accordingly. Um, honesty and credibility is critical to a public agency, and what I see coming out of this agency, is particularly the leadership, um, is, is far from, from an unbiased, un, it, it's lost credibility, and, and let me point it out, I don't have it all written out, so you'll excuse me stumbling. When I read a rail uh, feasibility study that all its peers are twice the cost or, you know, two to three times the cost of whatever is in the study, something's wrong. In fact, the smart train would be about would be a good comparison, and if we did that, ours would be closer to about $500 million to get d uh, done, something like that. When I read or hear that the traffic on Highway 1 is mischaracterized so much, and I won't go into those numbers, but I do know them, that it's misled on the importance of that traffic and how it relates to the train, you lose credibility and honesty. When I read that the Monterey Bay, the MBSST has a price in there, and then when they put it out to bid, it's three times the cost that's in that study. 
something's wrong. And if anybody thinks that all the con companies are gonna drop their price just because the estimates were three times lower than reality, something's wrong. And um, I'm just telling you that th you guys really don't have any credibility on doing something right. You are not drunken sailors with somebody's credit card going into a house of ill repute hoping to spend the public monies. Uh, on whatever you wish, you have financial restraints. You need to do that, and you need to be open and honest about how you go about it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, Good morning. my name is Tina Andrietta, and I need to read if that's okay. The Santa Cruz Rail Trail is going to do more for people with disabilities. The special needs community are be beloved elders, the school children, people who are poor and disenfranchised, people who cannot afford cars, insurance, will benefit from rail to trail. This inclusions of these community members is underdeveloped in Santa Cruz, and they are well worth it because they are us. 19 out of 100 Americans live with a disability. Whether a soldier comes back from war, an elder, or a child with a disability, they are our family, our neighbors, and loved ones. Or perhaps it's the friendly beggar, beg, you know, grocery beggar, that you see every week, he smiles or she smiles at you and says, Has, have a nice day. And you know what it means. They sincerely mean it. Do you want it to be the ones to tell the disabled community that they don't deserve a transportation service that supports their needs? Have you considered the disabled community? Reach out, get to know them. You'll find that they have, they want independence, they want to be part of the community, they, want, they don't wanna just rely on family members taking them uh, in their cars. A lot of them are able to, you know, we're talking about wheelchairs, walkers, young mothers with uh, uh, strollers who can't afford cars that are, would like to get on a train and be able to go from Watsonville to Santa Cruz, um, one of my friends, she's two young kids. She takes an hour, 45 minutes to an hour and 20 minutes to get from Watsonville because she can't afford to live here. She's third generation. She would love to have a rail. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, I'm Miles Ryder. I'm gonna try to get this three minutes done in two. Uh, only in the last few years have I paid much attention to the RTC. And this is what I've come to recognize. The population of the area of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is 44% is of the Santa Cruz County's total population. 44%, maybe everybody knew that, I didn't. Transportation issues are also disproportionately severe for that 44% of the population. I live, farm, run a business, I've raised a family and have kids that all attended Pajaro Valley Schools. We are severely under underrepresented on the RTC. Currently only three of the 12 seats come from the area of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Sometimes there's four, never there are five, which would be close, but not quite proportional representation. And so what do we have? Obviously, we've got mind-numbing uh, gridlock on Highway 1 that gets worse by the month and that has dramatically more severe impact on South County residents. We have side streets that are almost equally congested to uh, Highway 1 at the, at, well, it's all the time now. We have bus service stuck in the same uh, traffic. Uh, we have roads in the hills and the, and the Pajaro Valley that are nearly abandoned including the main artery of our most important agricultural crop, which I happen to grow, uh, where ruts and potholes are damaging the work of thousands of people. We have a boondoggle of a trail being worked on that is unlikely ever to re reach Watsonville. We have par prime farmland and city streets being used to store empty rail tanker cars. We have woefully inadequate rail service or have had woefully uh, inadequate rail service to where it actually matters. And this included, includes a mysterious complete stoppage of surface in the weeks before June 14th vote on a new contract. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Yeah, I'll do the last minute some other time. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, that uh, concludes the oral communications. Um, uh, Mr. Dondero, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Um, yes, we have uh, two handouts, uh, Item th one for item 31, which is uh, director's report, and um, what was it, the, uh, for item 34, the Unified Quarter Investment Study is a replacement uh, set of pages. Okay, thank you. Brings us to the consent uh, agenda. These are items we usually deal with in uh, all in one um, motion. Is there a, uh, Mr. Bertrand? Um, I don't want to pull anything, but I do want to make a comment from Capitol's perspective. Is that okay with the chair? On the consent, which consent agenda item are item you? Item 17. Item 17, a comment. Um, is there anybody else who wants to pull anything on the consent item? Uh, go ahead. Okay, I'd just like to point out, uh, thank you RTC for working with Capitola to um, make this um, transportation development proposal. Um, this will mean for Capitola that along Park Avenue, which leads out to the freeway, we'll be able to have uh, safe walkways. Uh, heretofore, it's been a path and very unsafe for people. Uh, people don't use that road at night. And also, also mean uh, five foot on either side for bike which is tremendous. So this is a great boom for the biking community and also for improving safety on Park Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Move the consent agenda. A motion by uh, Shepard. Second. Second by Brown. Uh, Mr. Johnson. I was just gonna say, I, I'll vote yes on everything but 23. So, um, Duly noted. 23, okay. Uh, is there anybody from the public that would like to pull anything on the consent agenda? Yes, sir. Um, I live in Watsonville, and uh, I use Highway 1 quite a bit. Sir, is there an item that did, did you do? Uh, I, I wrote a letter to the council uh, on Tuesday that uh, I don't know if you got distributed or not. I'm trying to just wait which item you're addressing on our, on our agenda so I can be oh, specific. Well, I'm talking about uh, transportation. Um, do you have just a uh, general uh, comment? Hi well, okay. I consider the uh, congestion of Highway 1 the number Excuse, excuse one. me, sir. We're, we're trying to vote on the consent agenda. I want to hear I'm what sorry, you have to uh, say. So what I'm going to do is this is not about the consent agenda. It's just a general comment. So I'm going to give you two minutes to talk on a general comment. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Okay, great. Go ahead. It, I'm oversimplifying the transportation problem, I'm sure. But to me, the number one uh, issue is Highway 1 congestion and then the extra 30 minutes or 45 minutes that it takes to go from Watsonville to Santa Cruz and vice versa much of the day. And so um, I would like to suggest that the, that the commission focus in on that issue and try to get a third lane in, uh, added all the way from Highway 17 to Aptos. To me, that is, would be, should be the first and primary uh, goal of this commission. So, Thank you for those comments. I appreciate them. <coughs> okay, I'll bring it back uh, to the chair. We're going to have a, a vote on the consent agenda item. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And except, uh, just note that there is a, a Commissioner Johnson voted no on item 23. Okay. We'll move uh, forward to um, commissioner reports. Any commissioner have any report? Seeing none. Um, I have a comment. Sure. I'd like to make a comment. In the public, um, the public um, build, um, there was a public comment about uh, people who need ADA and need uh, help getting back and forth in this county. And that touched me quite a bit. So this is actually a very personal statement of mine. Um, my mother had polio and she could not get around. It was very difficult getting her places, going on vacations. We did not go camping with my mother. So trying to understand what it means to people and individuals who need wheelchairs or any other kind of transportation aid is very difficult unless you are that person. So I appreciate those comments. I was lucky enough in one sense 
to learn from the time I was a child what it was like to live with a mother who could not get around. So keep that in mind when you think about ADA requirements and the money to need, the money needed to fund it. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Okay, our next item is we have a request from uh, uh, Commissioner Bertrand for an item to be discussed about a uh, Unified Quarter Investment Study Review Committee. So I'll turn this back to you again, uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my thought process on this has evolved. And when I jumped on this committee, uh, commission, excuse me, I was very much focused on the Unified Quarter Investment Study because I think that is a critical piece and it's been delivered. And so I was trying to figure out what is the best way for the commissioners here to do their due diligence and live up to the responsibility of our position to the County of Santa Cruz. So the idea to me came up, to ask the chair to appoint a subcommittee to actually deep dive down into the study itself. Individuals on this committee who would commit to spend their own time usually off of their budgeted time for whatever job they may have or maybe they've retired. But the idea is to actually spend some deep dive time so that we could help each other better understand and better ferret out the issues that are embedded in that study. So I still would like to see that and I would like to volunteer to be on that committee if the chair so goes in that direction. Commissioner Schiffern. We all have the responsibility Okay. We all have the responsibility of reading the Unified Corridor Study, and I don't think that we're all equal, but some are more equal than others. Um, I think we all need to uh, do it, and if commissioners don't do it, then that's their responsibility to their constituency. I don't support having a special subcommittee. Um, we're going to hear from the public in a number of forum, and it's going to come back to the commission, and we should we all should take our responsibility seriously. This is a critical study. The commission's gonna be making important decisions and um, we're all equal in having to respond to it. I don't think this is some area where we can depend on some commissioners to do uh, research on an item that we're all not involved in. We're all involved in the Unified Corridor Study. We're all gonna to need to vote on the Unified Corridor Study. And I don't think it's appropriate to set up a particular subcommittee to work on this uh, study separate from the public forum um, and separate from the commission meetings. Any other comments? Commissioner Johnson. Well, the only thing I would say is that we routinely uh, develop and implement subcommittees because subcommittees have the opportunity, uh, in the words of uh, Commissioner Bertrand, of uh, deep diving, drilling down, and um, really sp paying special attention and bringing out facts, uh, interviewing people that uh, a uh, that a whole commission probably could not. So, on the one hand, uh, we you know because we always have subcommittees, whether it's choosing chairs or we have a budget subcommittee. I mean, if you use that logic then we shouldn't have a budget subcommittee because every commissioner should be responsible for d d deep diving into the budget. But why do we have a budget subcommittee? Because those people are the ones who routinely meet, they get uh, probably additional information. So I, th I think it's a, a, somewhat of a fallacy to disregard uh, the, I, th I think the uh, idea of having a subcommittee on this matter. It's really that simple. Other comments? No. I just wanted to respect the intent of your suggestion. Um, Commissioner Schifrin is absolutely correct. We all have a responsibility to read it thoroughly and uh, analyze it thoroughly. Um, I think we could go either way as a commission. I just wanted to respect the intent of your suggestion, which is um, we have to take it very seriously and spend a lot of time um, analyzing what's been put before us. Um, I take Mr. Schifrin's comments. Also, and I was actually hoping you'd be on the committee. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not saying that out of, you know, trying to get laughs in the audience, but I am on the finance subcommittee, and you sit on the finance subcommittee, and I enjoy your comments, and I enjoy the fact that you put a lot of effort into 
making that committee successful. So I don't think this would be a committee that puts out a report and then the commission hears that report. This is a committee for us to get a better idea of the complexity of that study. So it's for people who would like to do it. It's not necessarily something that's going to hang up the commission in general. It's basically to help individuals who would like to participate to do a better, under, to create a better understanding of the report. Mr. Schiffer. Certainly if a minority of the commissioners want to get together and uh, talk about the study and get into it and spend more time on it, that's totally appropriate. We have, a, you know, as uh, Commissioner Johnson says, we have committees that meet on a regular basis on things that come forward on a regular basis. This is a one-time study that is of critical importance to some of the decisions that the commission is going to be making in the future. It's, it's not a situation where we have a, sort of an ongoing role where we were negotiating with UP to buy the rail line. We had a subcommittee to help with those negotiations. Yes, for particular kinds of tasks, it does make sense to have subcommittees. When we're all faced with having to make a decision on this study, then we're all, you know, we all have that same responsibility. If some sub, uh, commissioners want to get together and talk about it separately, as so long as they don't violate the Brown Act, that's totally appropriate. But to set up, a, f uh, you know, a sort of a formal subcommittee, what's going to be the role of staff? What role is it going to have with the public? It starts raising questions that, in, a, in the context in which this study is going forward, which is already pretty controversial, um, it's just going to add another level of complexity to it and confusion to it, in my view. So I, I, I certainly urge commissioners, if they want to get together and talk about it, to do so. Um, but I think set, you know, agreeing formally to set up a separate body to be doing that um, is, is not really appropriate. Commissioner Brown. Uh, like other commissioners, I uh, absolutely appreciate and respect the intent of the proposal. Um, but I think Commissioner Schifrin's point that there are, that those of us who want to get together and um, take a deeper dive or maybe um, uh, absorb some of this information in uh, a group setting, I think, I mean, I certainly think that we can do that um, without violating the Brown Act and would hope that staff can answer our questions as they arise um, rather than setting up a formal process. Um, that would work for me and I'd be happy to participate in that conversation. Okay. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Having, be, uh, having uh, been the, the newest member of this particular commission, um, it, it's been a tremendous uh, learning curve for me and I still, need a lot more of that um, attention on this and he, listening a lot more in terms of what our community has to offer. And, and I know that I've always had the door open for that as an opportunity. And a lot of things, I don't know what I don't know until I hear from you as the community members and do want to have a bit more dialogue with those that have a lot more depth of knowledge um, to the process to, to get us to this point with this corridor study. I don't know phase one. I'm, I'm smacked into here's phase two and your packet for uh, this afternoon to, or this, this morning to be looking over the materials and I will have a lot of questions that I don't know I need to be asking and that's why I'm gonna reach out to ask for help or any of the commissioners that would like to be willing to sit with me on this, whether it needs to be formalized or not, I'm wanting to be very open on both ends of com working with commissioners as well as the public um, to get a better handle and understanding of this and not having uh, having a, a fresh open mind for this as a commissioner. So I'm, I'm telling people I want that opportunity in time. Thank you. Any other comments? I'm going to go ahead and weigh in on this, and uh, then I'm going to look for a motion from somebody. Um, I, I can appreciate uh, the, the request and its sincerity of uh, Commissioner Bertrand to have a subcommittee. I, I think about uh, the subcommittees I've been on since I've been on this board and on Metro, and I've been on numerous subcommittees. And normally what they are is they're to facilitate an action. And I think that for us, um, as far as I'm concerned on the RTC, this is, this is game time for the RTC. This is the biggest thing we've had to deal with mm -hmm. since I've been on here. And, and it's not like we, you know, and sometimes a subcommittee helps to do work for others so they can bring back information we can use. Whereas this, I think this is critical to each person here to, to, to weigh in on this and to discuss it. 
And uh, I, I don't see it as an opportunity to break, break up into committees and discuss something. I think this is something where we need to get back with our constituents, deal with the public, and make a recommendation about how we're gonna move forward as a county. So I, and I don't wanna distract from staff and have to support a, a committee because that all requires that. So I, I don't personally see the need for it, but um, I'm looking for a motion for somebody on this, on this item. Well, I would move that we take no action on this item. Is there a second? You need a second. 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 We have a motion and a second to take no action on this item is, uh, let me open it up to the public and see if there's anybody in the public who wants to weigh in on this item. Two minutes. I really come back to the credibility issue and the numbers, and I'm not going to dive deep into it here, but there's a credibility on how it's presented in the numbers, and I think a review committee mm -hmm. would be really critical. That's it. Oh, great, thank you. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Colligan. Mr. Bottorf, Commissioner Bottorf, and all commissioners. My name is Bud Colligan. I'm the co-chair of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, and I'll, I'm also a board member of Greenway. Um, this issue, even this discussion here, has been a, a very divisive uh, topic uh, in our community. And I think the biggest reasons, and I don't have a position on, on uh, uh, Commissioner Bertrand's uh, suggestion or uh, uh, Commissioner Schifrin's uh, retort to that, but I would say that the biggest reason that this has been divisive is because there is no common set of facts. And uh, my sense is that the responsibility of the commission is to try to get to a common set of facts so that we can actually de be debating investment decisions and transportation decisions and not whether certain data is wrong and certain data is right. And that's where we've been for the last three years. So I would really urge you, whether it's in a subcommittee or not, to take the time to do this right. As uh, Commissioner Bottorf just said, this is game time. You know, we're gonna be making decisions on a billion dollars of investment. And this is a poor county that doesn't have a lot of money. So those decisions are gonna be critical. Um, the notion of arbitrary timelines on this whole thing is just ridiculous. Um, it sounds like, uh, you know, the Kavanaugh hearings. You know, we should, our objective should be to do this right and to get the right decisions, uh, not march to some arbitrary timeline. And those decisions should have the broadest public support. And the way to get broad public support is to have a common set of facts to start with. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and interrupt the public comment right now just for some clarity. The next item uh, after the director's report is we're going to talk about the unified quarter study and I believe that's why you're all here. I want to focus the comments on this item specifically. I'm going to be very specific. This is about whether we should form a subcommittee to discuss unified quarter study. We already know that we're all going to discuss it. So if you're going to come to the podium, I would like you to weigh in on whether you think there's a merit of having a subcommittee or not, <clears throat> not talking about the unified quarter study. It is our next item. Okay, thank you. Well, sort of coincidentally, it does uh, work with regard to the subcommittee. Uh, you know, I mentioned the underrepresentation of South County, and I think that um, all the commissioners need to support South County commissioners in protecting the interests of the un underrepresented constituents. I don't want to create a north-south battle, but um, th with this is a county with two ends, and, and they need to be treated fairly, and I think this committee could help in doing that, because right now we're looking, uh, the last thing we want to do is rush through this proposed approval. There is a schedule, it doesn't make a bit of sense, and the quarter studies full of weird combinations. So you be focusing on the quarter study, and I'm talking about a committee right now. Okay, uh, okay. then I, I would I, say. I would love to hear you talk when we get to the next item okay. about the unified quarter study. Uh, and, and okay, and I, I would support the ability because there's a, a proposed timeline that's very short. This is not about a timeline. Uh, okay. This is about a committee, and, and it's very specific, people. We're, we are gonna talk about a unified quarter study. Okay. Thank you. And I would recommend that this committee include a more equal representation 
from South County. Thank you. I, I just want to, um, this is Jessica Evans again. I just wanted to say that um, I don't think that you guys should have a separate official working committee. I think that you know, the idea of getting together and, and brainstorming and, and, and working together, I mean, you know, we all know that when you get together and you talk about stuff, you can learn it better and faster and you can share your perspectives. I wanna urge every single person, every single person on this committee to please pay attention and work hard on this project. Don't blow it off. Don't walk away, don't be lazy. Do the work, this is why you're here. If you want to be on this committee, please be willing to do the work, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Ms. McNulty. Hi, I do like the idea of a subcommittee and to be honest, I don't know enough of your bylaws to know whether this would be possible or not, but I would actually love to see that subcommittee include representatives from some of the organizations who have been part of this conversation. I know that right now we've got public meetings scheduled for the 15th and the 16th, and I've been invited, and I was told one person from our, our, our organization may come to a one hour and 15 minute meeting on the 17th which to be honest seems incredibly inadequate for a conversation that has been driving this country or this county for so long and the polarizing situation that we're in. I mean, for exactly the same reason that Andy Schifrin said he does not want to have the subcommittee because it is a polarizing conversation, it's the exact reason that we do need to have it. And if at all possible, it should not be constrained to only members of this commission, it should include stakeholder groups because one hour and 15 minutes is not enough to arise at a compromise and to assume that we can't. Well, that's a big failure because we know some of our speakers, several of our speakers mentioned that to get funding for any of these projects will be in a better place if we have a community consensus. So going for a community consensus, having this subcommittee and engaging some of us at the table as part of that conversation that is not an hour and 15 minutes long, but that is probably a couple of months long. Because to be fair, to spend this money wisely to make these plans and come up with equitable solutions that are going to have an impact, we need that input. We need to work together. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Barry Scott, Aptos. Um, Precisely because I think we've seen a very asymmetrical kind of a public relations battle between the, the two opposing sides with respect to the rail corridor. Uh, I think every member needs to be, I think the committee you need to have is a all of you committee. You need to all of you do the work and the idea of bringing in stakeholders, it's frightening to me. Again, they already have an, a, an asymmetrical level of power and funding and an operation while others are trying to advocate for transit and cycling and, and fairness. I, I that you have a huge task before you. You have a huge task before you. And uh, I, I, I know that you all want to do the right thing. Uh, so I would, I would advise against a committee and I'd further advise uh, that you be very cautious about what stakeholder groups are able to do to influence your decisions. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Okay, I'll bring it back. I'll bring it back uh, before I vote to comment, uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. I wanted to offer a friendly amendment to the maker of the motion that we encourage um, members of the commission to get together on an ad hoc basis to discuss and and, and educate one another. Um, and um, obviously, that can't be a Brown Act meeting. But I just want to encourage folks to get together and it's talk. Acceptable to, to the maker of the motion. Right. Me too. Second. Motion, second, step. Any other comments before we vote? Mr. Bertrand. With that friendly amendment, I will agree with the motion. Okay, so we're gonna take a, can I get a roll call vote? Commissioner Bertrand? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Randy Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Commissioner Caput? Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Mulhern? Yes. Commission Alternate Johnson? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Botorf? Aye. That motion carries unanimously, thank you. 
And just to be clear, that means we're gonna be taking no action uh, and there will be not, will not be a committee. It will be each own commissioner's responsibility to take this seriously and to weigh in when the time comes. Okay, that moves on to the next item, which will be our director's report. Mr. Dondero. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, just a few items for you this morning. Um, many of you may be aware of a, a very narrow walkway that uh, hangs on the side of the San Lorenzo River trestle uh, connecting the boardwalk and the Seabright neighborhood. Uh, and on September 18th, the California Coastal Commission unanimously approved uh, the plans for a new 10-foot wide uh, multi-use path. Um, and uh, this is a project under the city of Santa Cruz and uh, they're the lead agency on it. And this will connect the Seabright neighborhood with the boardwalk area, uh, the Riverwalk levee path and downtown Santa Cruz. And we expect to see that completed uh, before Memorial Day of next year. Um, uh, another trail item, uh, the North Coast uh, Rail Trail uh, draft EIR was uh, released back in August and we took public comments until <coughs> September 24th. Uh, staff received approximately 100 comments from members of the public agencies and organizations. Uh, two public meetings were held, one on August 22nd in Santa Cruz and one on August 23rd in Davenport. RTC staff and consultants are in the process of reviewing comments and addressing the issues that were raised. The final EIR is expected to be released this winter, uh, although exact timing will depend on the time needed to respond to um, all of these comments. Uh, the RTC's website contains the draft EIR, the slides that were presented at the public meetings, and maps of the proposed alignment, as well as alternatives studied. Um, once the EIR is certified, the RTC selects a preferred project. Uh, the lead agency on this segment, the Federal Highway Administration's Central Federal Lands Division, will complete the design, uh, complete the NEPA clearance, that's the Federal Environmental Clearance, uh, and the construction. Uh, funding for this project comes from uh, a $6 million grant from uh, Federal Highways Federal Lands Access Program uh, and also funds from Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, uh, RTC's RSTP program, and Measure D. Uh, construction is anticipated uh, for the 2020 calendar year. Um, also, I'm uh, According to our uh, agency uh, rules and regs, uh, I'm reporting to you that two RTC staffers will be traveling out of state to attend the Railvolution Conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, October 21st through 24th. Um, I've got an item in here about projects at risk. Uh, our assemblymen uh, talked extensively about uh, Senate Bill 1 and what's at risk if Proposition 6 should be passed. So I've attached uh, the uh, table of projects uh, which you, this commission approved back in December of last year. Uh, and it shows uh, uh, several columns. Uh, one is the column of the amount of funding that you approve. That's assuming that Senate Bill 1 remains whole. But there's also a column that shows worst case scenario. And uh, whatever agency you're with, I think you'll find some uh, projects in there that you're familiar with. And uh, if Proposition 6 should pass by the voters, um, then you're looking at the worst case scenario. So that's uh, just an information item for you. Uh, we've also included uh, a photo of uh, Assemblymember Stone along with Assemblywoman Caballero uh, who visited the um, Agron um, biofuels plant in Watsonville recently. Uh, and they also met with um, uh, the group folks in the photo including CPUC inspectors, uh, the president of Western Iowa Energy, and Howard Cohen who's uh, marketing manager for the railroad. Um, and uh, the two assembly members received a briefing on rail operations, both current and planned. And then finally, uh, a, a photo of the uh, locomotive that just arrived in Watsonville. Um, this is uh, going to serve the needs of uh, local uh, freight customers. Owner Progressive Rail says a local company will change the name on uh, from Wisconsin Northern to St. Paul and Pacific, which is the local railroad's name. 
and replace City of Barron with the uh, City of Watsonville. So that concludes my report, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. That's questions, Mr. I, Mr. I just want to make a comment on the San Lorenzo River trestle yes. uh, project. It's really exciting that the Coastal Commission has approved that. I just wanted to give a little bit of history and blow the horn of uh, Commissioner Coonerty and the Secretary of Resources, John Laird, who uh, actually at the groundbreaking for the Twin Lakes project uh, agreed to try to find some state money to pay for that project and uh, directed, uh, directed us and the city of Santa Cruz to a $500,000 grant to help with the construction and really sort of gave that project uh, uh, a kick forward and it's exciting that it now hopefully will come to fruition. It's a, it's a, it's a pathway that's probably used by hundreds if not thousands of people every year as people from the east side get to the boardwalk. So um, widening that trestle, which is now, that pathway, which is now very dangerous, encourages people to walk over the uh, railroad tracks, which is not a good idea. I think it's exciting that that's moving forward. So thank you, and thanks for the commission support. Thanks Staff. for the comments. Any other comments? Okay, um, good. Well, then we're going to move on to our next item, which is the uh, Caltrans report. Uh, Ms. Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. I would just like to to also underscore some of the points from, from Assemblyman Stone and that our future is multimodal. Uh, Caltrans has just released the state rail plan, and, of course, you received that um, very comprehensive pre presentation last time in Watsonville. And the uh, state rail plan shows how we intend to integrate our systems and modes and work, work very diligently on integrating freight um, along with um, electrification of our systems, blending the high-speed rail with regular um, conventional rail, uh, leveraging uh, new technologies to make our rail infrastructure work better for California into the future. In District 5, we're also kicking off the development of our bicycle and pedestrian plan. We're very excited about that. This is a statewide effort following on the, the state plan toward an active California. There are 12 districts in California, and District 5, I'm pleased to report, is one of the first ones um, in the state to develop um, its plan, and we look forward to working with your communities and your staff on that. Uh, we also hope to announce in the very near future the opening of a charging station to green the fleet. We um, have been working through the Monterey Bay Air Resources District to install a fast charging station at the Camp Roberts rest area south of here. So when you are making trips to see us in San Luis Obispo, you're welcome anytime, uh, you should have an opportunity in the near future to top up your tank there at the Camp Roberts rest area, top up your battery <laughs> at the Camp Roberts rest area. <laughs> I um, also want to just mention a few funding opportunities that are coming forward. Um, uh, you, you have benefited greatly in the past and currently from Caltrans funded grants, planning grants. We, uh, we provide um, new opportunities every year for this. The newest cycle um, is the applications are due for our sustainable transportation planning grants on November 30th. And on October 19th, we will be having a workshop in our office uh, at 10 a.m. Come on down. Uh, two opportunities from the U.S. DOT about new and exciting things include um, uh, sponsoring the formation of two new university transportation centers. Uh, the U.S. DOT is offering $15 million to fund these two centers, uh, providing students an opportunity to participate in cutting-edge transportation research. One research program focuses on congestion relief and the other on improving the durability and extending the life of transportation infrastructure. Uh, funding from these um, two centers would be from the uh, Federal Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2018, uh, and eligible applicants are limited to seven and a half million for each center, so 15 million for, for two, uh, and that's a national um, program. The other national program is um, by the Federal Transit Administration is offering $6.3 million nationwide for transit coordination projects to improve access to health care. As you know, um, the, the, the um, 
importance in providing for equity among how our transportation system serves our, our communities and our public is to ensure that there's equitable and fair access to health care. So with that, um, with that emphasis, uh, this program is also um, open and applications are due November 13th. Finally, I would just mention that we are working to release the relieve the backlog of infrastructure needs with SB1. And you'll see in the project update that's included in your packet, uh, this time there are four projects listed that have SB1 funding, and they represent a construction cost accumulated total of about $50 million of those, just those four projects, in addition to all the other projects that are listed in that report that are ongoing. Any questions? Any questions for Ms. Loeb? Uh, Commissioner Schiffman. Yes, at the last uh, commission meeting, you weren't here, and I don't remember the name of the person who was, but I raised the issue of the possibility of Caltrans contracting with the downtown streets team um, to do litter uh, cleanup on the north coast on Highway 1. Um, the person did follow up, uh, did talk to the maintenance uh, division, and they were supposed to get in touch with uh, Commissioner Coonerty's office. Uh, my, my request is that you look into what's happened. We haven't heard from them, um, and we're hoping that they will follow through, and it would be possible to get uh, a contract to uh, help with the cleanup on the, on the highway segment that goes from the city of Santa Cruz to the city's landfill. We'll follow up with you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, so some of my constituents have brought that up too, and uh, the person that was here last time did send a letter to the commission, and I pass that information on to those who are interested. So I thank you for that. Commissioner Kapp. This is not working, so uh, Randy, you'll thank share. You. pedestrian push button light for Marchant Street and East Beach right by Watsonville High School. Uh, it was on the work order for uh, 2019 and the funding supposedly is there. I just want an update and make sure it's moving along. Yes. Commissioner Caput, I believe all the ADA projects and the pedestrian signal projects are on schedule. Um, I don't. I don't have um, a, a more specific update on that location, but okay. to my knowledge, those the pedestrian signal upgrades. Right, and that's March, March and the East Beach, where the okay. freeway actually makes uh, becomes one way for probably about half a mile. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you for those information, Ms. Lowe. Okay, we'll move on. Um, I can't believe I'm saying this. We've been waiting forever, seems like, and saying everything. We're not gonna do anything until a unified quarter investment study is here, and it's here. I'm, I'm happy to say it is here. Um, which means that all of us, uh, the commissioners and everybody in the public, all have a lot of work to do right now. So um, let's get started, and I have a presentation from uh, uh, Mr. Dondero. Okay, I'd, I'd like to introduce the item, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the primary objective of the Unified Corridor Investment Study is to identify multimodal investments to serve the community's future transportation needs. The study looks at potential projects beyond those already funded in the Measure D expenditure plan. The study was conceived just prior to the 2012 acquisition of the rail right-of-way, which provides a parallel corridor with unused capacity. Implied in this study is the question, how best can we use the rail right-of-way in combination with transportation improvements on the parallel corridors, Highway 1 and SoCal and Freedom, to address future transportation needs in the community. Measure D specifies that RTC will evaluate future uses of the rail right-of-way. The UCS has been informed by a public process over several years to obtain input from the community and this commission. At this point, I'd like to thank Caltrans, our partners, uh, for the initial uh, planning grant that we got for this. Um, we've also added some Measure D money to it, but um, Caltrans staff has shown a real interest in this project. We appreciate that. 
Um, so at this point, I'd like to introduce the project team. Um, not all of these people will speak to you today. Um, first of all, our <laughs> RT RTC staff members uh, include Ginger Dykar and uh, Grace Blakesley, who put many, many hours into getting this uh, report out to you. And I've been working uh, with Grace and Ginger uh, throughout the process. And then our consultant team is comprised of Frederick Ventner, uh, engineer and project manager, Michael Schmidt, who's uh, led the modeling effort and the very technical stuff, and Daryl Deponcier, uh, who's done much of the performance measure analysis. And then finally, Sarah Graham is here from Strategic Economics, and they're a subconsultant to Kimley Horn, uh, doing the uh, consulting, uh, the uh, economic piece of the uh, report. So at this time, I'd like to hand it over to Frederick. And uh, I'll pre present uh, some highlights of the study. Thank you, George. Uh, good morning, commissioners and public. Um, indeed, a long awaited moment. We're very proud to present to you um, the step two analysis results. Um, I'm just going to do some brief introductions, and then uh, Daryl's going to uh, walk you through um, the results from the performance measures. So going back, for those of you, just a little bit of a recap, the historic study corridor includes basically three routes. It um, is SoCal Drive and also Freedom Boulevard. Those are arterial streets <laughs> that start in Watsonville and they extend all the way through to Santa Cruz downtown. The second route is Highway 1, um, uh, which also starts in, uh, in Watsonville and it ends at Davenport. Um, goes through the freeway sections, also the street section, then um, once it becomes uh, more an arterial road, and then a, a, a highway section um, north of Santa Cruz. And then um, the rail right-of-way corridor, um, which runs from the power road station um, all the way to uh, Davenport. A quick recap, uh, you will recall, and just to, to explain where we are, we started out last year with goals and performance measures, identifying the goals and specifically the performance measures that were uh, regarded as the starting point for this um, analysis that we're presenting today. We've identified various projects, and those would be capital improvement projects that would go above and beyond and would also include some Measure D projects. Um, and those were uh, also then we developed the scenarios. So you will remember there were scenarios A through E, um, had a workshops, input from the community, presented it to um, you, and um, we selected four alternative scenarios that would be analyzed, mixed some of the modes around in those. Um, and then here we are today with step two, which is a presentation of the performance um, um, measures um, analysis based on the um, inputs um, up to now. So there are really three big components in this and it gets extremely complex. If you really look through the data, um, you know, so we're gonna present it slowly today. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions. There's lots of more opportunity to also get questions and feedback in the future. But there's a component of this that regards infrastructure. It's like what projects can we do? How are we gonna implement them? How will it work? What will they look like? What will they cost? Then we took those um, infrastructure projects, put them in the model, or did it off model, and said, what are the performance, what are, the, what are these projects doing to travel, right? And travel is not just for cars, it's for cars, uh, bikes, beds, buses, and also then again for the rail as well. Um, and then, um, so, and then the last step from those, so you have those two components, they go into a performance measure um, that we then present um, today. So a quick recap for the uh, scenarios, uh, just so everybody knows, and we would love for you in your packet on uh, the performance dashboard, and it's on page 185. I think it's gonna help, be very helpful if you can keep this, um, these scenarios, pictures in front of you, because everything is color coded the way we present it in the rest of the presentation, and you can clearly see what it is. So scenario A, um, covers uh, HOV lanes, um, various improvements along Highway 1, which includes the ox lanes, meter ramp, metering of the ramps, um, improvements on San, Lor San Lorenzo River, the bridge, and Mission Street improvements. We've got the, what we call the BRT light. So if we talk about BRT light, that would be a BRT light service on the arterial system, which would run in, on along Freedom Boulevard and SoCal. Uh, drive. And then some various intersection improvements. Um, so that would be on the street system and for the rail corridor, a trail only option. 
Scenario B is a little more uh, transit focus with a lot less um, uh, freeway improvements uh, to enhance, um, to, to, so the intent was to see what is the, really the transit do a little bit for us. So bus on shoulder, um, do metering on the ramps to help flow on the, on the freeway network, and then some street improvements, we keep the BRT light. And then for the rail trail, we have um, the PED um, and bike trail with the rail service. Scenario C, um, was also he more heavy on um, transit, but instead of the rail service on the rail right away, we put a BRT service. So that's probably one of the bigger changes. So there's a BRT service on the rail corridor in scenario C. Scenario E is a little bit more generic. So we have some HOV lanes, freeway improvements. We left out a, some of the street improvements localized, but there we have the rail um, on the trail as well. So look at the colors, blue for A, yellow for B, C for orange, and E for green. So I'm gonna hand it over to Daryl, and he's gonna walk you through the results from the performance measures. Thank you. Morning, commissioners. Um, so just to start off, just to recap what Frederick mentioned, the performance measures that were evaluated here were all based on the goals that were determined right at the very beginning of this study. Um, they were based on your own objectives at the countywide level and um, were designed to maximize the benefits that come out of whatever improvements are ultimately constructed as part of this. So the um, safety, reliability and efficiency, environment and health, economic vitality, equitable access, all of those were the foundation under which the performance <laughs> measures that we're going to talk about are. Um, so first off with safety, uh, we collected data from the California Highway Patrol to understand what kind of uh, safety history we have on the corridor, looking at all the different collisions in the different corridor sections. And we made assumptions that in the future by 2035, based on changes in traffic volume, those collisions would also increase. So from that baseline, we then looked at the different project alternatives that were part of each scenario and um, used Federal Highway Administration research and various sources to understand what those types of improvements were likely to do in terms of impacting crashes. And we determined that the crash reductions would be as we're showing here. Um, so based on, Without any improvements at all, it looked like we would have about 3,300 crashes a year um, in the county and that um, we would be saving up to two to two to 300 crashes depending on the alternative. Scenario B had the best reduction. So that was based both on reductions in traffic volumes that we'd get from increasing transit and from those improvements. The other side of uh, safety is the cost. So crashes have cost associated with them. Um, it's up to $10 million for a fatality, $100,000 for an injury, um, up to $10,000 for PDO, for property damage only crashes. Um, so crashes uh, currently cost almost $500 million a year in the county and in the future we would project it to be over $700, $700 million a year. Um, with the various alternatives proportional to the amount of crash reduction, we would see savings of between 50 and $80 million a year, scenario B, because that had the highest crash reduction was the one that had the biggest reduction. So in terms of reliability and efficiency, um, auto, average auto speeds were probably the best indicator of where we're getting those efficiencies in for vehicular traffic. Um, this is a countywide average av auto speed that we're showing here based on what we get out of the travel demand model. Um, we expect that um, as yet traffic volumes increase in the future, we'll see speeds go down um, as congestion increases. So when we look at our um, various scenarios, we're projecting that the future baseline will actually um, have a bit of a speed reduction compared to now, as you would expect. Scenarios A and E, um, effectively would bring traffic congestion levels to where it is now based on uh, the fact that we have increased capacity on SR1. So the fact that these differences look pretty small, but remember we're talking about the entire countywide traffic system. So just that a few facilities are making that much difference is pretty big. Um, the other side of the uh, coin here is transit travel time. So that's a tricky one to measure. 
but what we ultimately decided to do to show you guys today is what it would look like on the three different routes, um, the rail corridor, SR1, and uh, SoCal Freedom Corridor. And we can see for each one, that's the travel time in minutes for those different routes, depending on what options we have on the table. So scenario A, we don't have a rail option, so that one isn't there. But we, we can see that there are rail services and services express bus on SR1 using an HOV lane were the best performing transit travel times to minimize the um, time distance between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Um, then lastly, we've got mode share. So all of our scenarios would reduce auto traffic um, as a proportion of overall trips. Um, we're increasing transit, bike and walking in all the scenarios. The ones that invest in transit more increase that transit benefit. So if we look at scenario B, that's where we have the, mo the largest variety of transit options. So we're seeing the highest switch over to there. Um, and then when you look at scenarios B and E, those ones include the tr rail trail as well as a buffered bike lane along SoCal Freedom. So we get a slightly better um, transition to bike trips on those two scenarios. And the clickers. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, so vehicle miles traveled, that's basically the number of miles when you add the number of miles every vehicle travels and add them up all together. Um, right now, we've got about five and a half million vehicle miles traveled per day in the county. We're projecting that by the 2035, that would increase to about six million. So when we look at our various alternatives, um, the ones that invest in SR1 with adding capacity will slightly increase vehicle miles traveled because people are transitioning from more direct surface roads to the freeway where they can drive faster. The ones that don't make that investment and we put more people into transit will reduce the vehicle miles traveled. Um, when we look at it on the other side in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, we see that all the um, scenarios are pretty similar in the outcome there. The scenarios with the higher VMTs also have higher efficiencies, so that, that um, brings that difference down a little bit. When we look at the no build based on baseline, we're also seeing a pretty big reduction in GHG, and that's because of the assumptions in the model about improved vehicle fleet efficiency in the future and um, just reduced emissions in general because of that. And then we looked at environmentally sensitive areas. It was an important part of um, the Measure D requirement that we did in environmental analysis. So we explored several different factors. We looked at um, uh, natural habitat, we looked at um, drainage, water, wetlands, seismic faults, we looked at the just topography, we looked at flood and erosion hazards, hazardous materials, farmland, um, all of those various types of things that could be impacted by this study. So this is a, one example. We have maps of all of those things in the final report. This is showing our uh, habitat areas. Um, and then we mapped each one of those uh, and then the three study corridors to see where those study corridors would overlap with any of these environmental sensitivities. Um, and then for each scenario, we looked at where the actual construction activity would be based on those scenarios to refine that mapping and identified the locations of each and every one of those overlaps so that we could um, determine basically how many miles of uh, impact we would likely have to each of those different sensitivities. So again, the scenarios came out with fairly similar results. The um, biggest changes would have been in the North County based on what type of uh, alternatives we're constructing along that route. Uh, another big factor um, for our goals was equity. So um, household transportation costs is a pretty important factor there. Uh, vehicles are very expensive to operate, so those drive a significant portion of the household costs. Um, the difference between a uh, household that owns one vehicle versus two is pretty substantial. Um, basically, we're talking about almost $45 a day in expense per household if you have two vehicles. Um, so these alternatives have the opportunity to help households reduce from a two vehicle to a one vehicle model because there would be additional transportation options for them. Transit would become more accessible. Bicycle and pedestrian trips are, are a little bit easier. 
So when we look at the projected um, difference between where things are now and where things are in the future, where this, these alternatives would bring the average household transportation cost back to similar to where it is now, despite the fact that inflation is likely to increase transportation costs ahead of um, incomes. Uh, then we also want to look at equity. So the level of investment we're putting out there, is it going to benefit everybody equally? Is it going to um, disproportionately benefit one group over another? So based on the population in the county, if um, 14 cents of every dollar of investment went to a transportation disadvantaged household, then we could say we have a proportional level of investment. These scenarios, all of them are closer to 25 cents of a dollar. That's based on um, travel demand modeling. We've looked and seen for each one of those projects who's likely to use it and the users from the transportation disadvantaged areas of the county um, represent about 25% of the users for all of the scenarios. Um, so for economic vitality, there's a number of things that go in that, but one of the important ones is level of public investment. So how much do these things cost and how much money do we have on the table right now? So for each of the scenarios, we have identified here how much the overall package would cost to build and then how much of currently identified funding is there from local sources and known grant programs and um, other things like that. These do assume the continuation of uh, SB1, so um, Proposition 6 could change this uh, outlook a little bit, but that's where things stand right now. So Scenario C um, would have the lowest public investment need, while Scenario E is the highest, right? Um, and then in terms of ongoing costs, so that was just the capital. This is um, talking about transit. So for the transit options, um, each we have to maintain and operate those services. So uh, depending on the level of service out there and the revenues available, uh, this is what we have now. So scenario B has the highest operation cost because that's where we're adding the most vehicle miles of transit into the system. Scenario E would be second. Uh, assuming that we're bringing in fair revenues and all that other kind of stuff, we have funding as shown to uh, cover most of those, but there's a little bit more additional funding that would need to be found. Uh, there's also costs associated with roadway improvements um, and other things that we don't aren't reflecting here. Um, those are typically maintained by local agencies and Caltrans and whatnot, so uh, those need to be considered as well. And then I'll uh, pass it over to Sarah to continue the economic discussion. Hi, good morning. I'm Sarah Graham with Strategic Economics, and we conducted an assessment of economic benefits associated with the projects. And that assessment is based on the premise that transportation projects um, generate economic be benefits by improving access for households, for businesses, and for visitors. And for each scenario, we evaluated the change in visitor tax revenue and other benefits, um, such as property value or development potential and business performance, um, using the factors shown here on the slide. So we thought about the area impacted by the transportation improvement. Is it corridor wide or is it very local? Um, we looked at who benefits from the <coughs> individual improvements, is it, is it households, is it visitors, is it, is it businesses? Um, we also thought about, is the project creating a new transportation route? Is it connecting up destinations in a new way? Um, and then finally, we thought about, is it creating a new amenity, a new attraction that would be in addition to a new travel path? So. Wrong way. Um, to measure the visitor tax revenue, we evaluated how the individual projects could influence visitor behaviors like hotel stays and spending. And many of the projects included are actually located away from the major visitor destinations, and therefore those projects would be assumed to have sort of a marginal and diffuse impact on these factors. Um, but those projects along the rail corridor 
would significantly benefit visitors by linking up um, visitor destinations um, via bicycle, pedestrian access, or transit. So based on how each of the projects could influence visitor behavior, we measured how that would translate into changes in transit occupancy tax, also known as the hotel tax, and visitor-related sales tax. Um, so shown on this bar graph, um, the no-build scenario reflects a general continuation of historic trends in visitor spending, and then each scenario represents an increment of change over that no-build scenario, ranging from about $760,000 to $1.2 million on an annual basis. Um, and then in addition to the visitor-related tax revenue, we also evaluated each of the transportation projects for its potential impacts on actually a pretty broad range of economic benefits, um, including changes in business location decisions, development potential, business performance, local tax revenue, and user benefits. Um, those project level impacts were then translated into an assessment of the relative level of benefits for each of the benefit categories at the scenario level, and that's what's shown here. For example, the development potential and for development potential and property values, research shows that projects providing new connections or new access are likely to have the greatest impact on development. So new transit service and other new facilities that connect destinations would be expected to have relatively larger impacts on development and therefore the scenarios that include those types of projects are ranked higher. Similarly, improvements that ease access for businesses would be expected to have a relatively larger impact on business location decisions. So scenarios that include key highway improvements and local um, intersection improvements would be expected to impact those decisions, and scenarios that include those types of projects were ranked relatively higher. So, um, Actually, the, the, this shows the results um, on a scenario basis that includes all the impacts from individual projects. Um, and with that, I'm actually turning it back to Frank. Thank you. So there's about a trillion numbers in front of you. Okay, so um, we hope that we're not gonna have, uh, even if we mold the divided by about a thousand, I hope we don't have that many questions, but there will be questions. Um, also, in terms of the process, we know that um, you know, this document was posted Friday. Um, it's a lot of information. If you read it, every time I read it, there's still something new that pops up at me, and you know, I've developed my own little cheat sheets, and I'm like, what's this say? And then I think again, so we have more outreach coming up. Um, we are having stakeholder meetings, and those would be specific groups that have been identified. They were also part of the uh, step one process. Um, we're gonna have um, advisory committees from RTC meetings coming up, public workshops in a couple of weeks, and also focus group meetings. Um, and of course, there's gonna be um, a agency outreach and presentations to the city council. So there is, over the next month, um, a whole process involved to get more comments, present this again, get the questions in, and then um, really developing a preferred scenario that will then come back uh, to you uh, November 15th. Um, um, and then um, taking action uh, December 6th, um, the end of the year, on, on this project. Um, I think that's uh, the presentation in a nutshell. Um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the presentation and for delivering us the document. Uh, I'm gonna hope that to encourage my commissioners to uh, maybe not have so many questions, but take the time to look into this, which we all know we need to do, and. Uh, and move forward. Uh, what, what I am going to do is, uh, before I open up the public comment, is uh, it was mentioned that this is this is this is a big deal. It's serious, 
and I want to allocate as much time as we possibly can. So, uh, because we're not going to resolve anything today, because I, as was just mentioned, this document is a week old, and we all need to research it. I'm going to put the uh, this item on the agenda for the TPW meeting on October 18th to be the sole discussion item. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say sole, but the primary discussion item at that meeting to allow at least another couple, maybe two, three hours to discuss this because I know we need to fully vet this as we move forward. So by my scale, that will give the TPW meeting of October 18th and then our regular meeting of November 1st. And then as Frederick said, we, we're going to make a decision on this on December 6th with the other workshops. Hopefully have enough time for us all to get our feelings known and more importantly to, to research the issues and, and to make a, a, a good decision for Santa Cruz County. So with that, uh, any questions uh, of the board before I open up to the public? Mr. Johnson. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. So um, I appreciate you, um, this being presented to us. Um, now, when you mentioned the, the TPW, would it be in a public place like this instead of the small? Uh, yeah, yes. Okay. Um, and you mentioned December 6th as a final date. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that we want to move forward on things like this, but at the same time, I'm not going to commit or lock myself into a uh, kind of an arbitrary time for us to vote on this because uh, it may work out that de December 6th is the very best time for us to decide, but it may not. I'm going to amend that to proposed date to vote. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Moore. Uh, thank you very much. I just had a, a couple of questions. One, a process question. Um, we're going to be installing a new executive director. Will that executive director have an opportunity to weigh in on the staff report prior to a staff recommendation? Um, it's my hope, if our schedule proceeds, that we have a new executive director on board by December 3rd. So I'm not sure how that is going to weigh into his ability to weigh into that and to, that's our he, timeline. He, he or she will be he or she. implementing this planning level document that's going to inform our funding allocation decisions for, for the foreseeable future. Um, I would imagine that he or she might be interested in having some voice in the decision making process. Absolutely, and that's why I think to, to Mr. Johnson's point, uh, the date of December 6th right now is a target date. Uh, and, and by no means, I don't think this board should be bound to that. I think if we move along as planned and it seems like that's the appropriate time to vote, we can just say we're not gonna vote on this item before December 6th. Okay, yeah, and then, thank you. Um, and, and then just, a, 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 well, a question about, about the data that's presented in the report. Um, scenarios A and B don't include freight rail uh, s scenario C only includes freight rail and ops in Watsonville, but we have a 10-year contract with Progressive Rail for freight service on the full 32-mile corridor. How does that affect the outcomes of the scenarios if we insert freight rail service into all the scenarios? Um, well, the contract, to, to my, correct me on this uh, if, or if, if, I, if, if there's any mistake in this, our contract with um, Progressive Rail is contingent on uh, once this board uh, receives a uh, staff recommendation on the on the on the study, which we have not received. We just received the document. There will be a staff recommendation. From the date of the staff recommendation, a 90-day clock ticks as to when the Progressive Rail has an exit clause. Oh, no, I mean it, we, we we considered the the impacts on on. The, the county, our transportation infrastructure on, in each of these scenarios with various components comprising, composing the, these scenarios, but all, all of our scenarios are lacking a critical feature being the freight rail service. So none, none of our, our scenarios have considered the, the full actual transportation package except for what is uh, scenario E. Um, and see for, for freight rail service in Watsonville. What I'm saying is that that the environmental condi conditions have changed, or the policymaking environment has changed since we initiated the scenario analysis, and now we have freight rail service. How does that affect 
the outcomes pro projected in these scenarios? And I guess that's a question for the consultants. Does, does injecting uh, freight rail service into all of the scenarios affect the outcomes? Or would you say that because it affects all of them, uh, they all will be similarly affected? Like, like, like for example, every, we, we're, we're funding uh, Measure D projects regardless of the scenarios. And so those are, are anticipated in the outcomes of the scenario analysis but we did not analyze the effects of freight rail service along a thir the 32 mile corridor in the scenarios. How does that affect the analysis? If, if I might, uh, Mr. Chair, um, sure. in, in negotiating an agreement with uh, Progressive Rail, the commission kept in mind the fact that this study was coming to you and you wanted you know, you know, the options available in that agreement so you could make your decision on, on this study uh, without having a, you know, a full commitment to that, uh, to any particular type of rail service. So, so the agreement does allow the R the RTC to select scenarios that don't have rail service. No, I, I'm not talking about the progressive rail contract. I'm talking about the the effects of freight rail service on the scenarios. So, for example, the freight rail service is the primary use of the rail line. How does that intersect with the uses? on the rail line for passenger rail service or transit if the primary use on the rail line is freight. I think Ms. Dykar wants to give us some information on this. Please, Ginger. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Ginger Dykar, Senior Transportation Planner here and Project Manager for the Unified Corridor Study. Um, We've heard a lot of comments from the community and I believe your commissioners in the past too about how best to do this analysis. And if we could have done it all on a project by project basis, that would have been brought a lot of good information. And if you look through the port report, we did that as much as we possibly could. But given the tools that we have, and in particular the travel demand model that requires the transportation projects to be brought together. But your deci decision as it comes up could potentially create a, a new scenario that is not one of these four scenarios, and then we would bring the information together for that particular scenario in order to um, move that forward in the future. Does that answer your question? So, so there, there, could, there could be, these could be refined further now that we have this new information? That's correct. Great, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Ms. Decker. I'm gonna start all, all the way down. <laughs> Any questions on that end? Ms. Johnson, go ahead. Nara, yeah, it's going. Um, I have some concern um, that Patrick had regarding <coughs> the lack of freight being part of the of the analysis. But I did have a couple of questions. Um, and first of all, I want to thank the staff and the consultants for the report. Very enlightening. A lot of information. I think very well done. And I hope that those in the community that have questioned the validity of this report, with some of us on the commission will recognize the level of hard work and um, the level of information that's put before us, I think does give us a lot of tools um, to make some good decisions. And so I just wanna thank you for that and acknowledge um, the credibility of the document. I think it's credible anyway. Um, I wanted to know from the consultants, what were your sources for the cost estimates included in the report? Um, Frederick Venter, so for, um, whew, where do we start? So for the Highway 1 projects, um, improvement projects is mainly the Caltrans um, data that's available, the HOV lanes, the auxiliary lanes, um, and the um, ramp metering. Um, for the arterial railway network, um, for the Buffett bike lanes, for the BRT um, improvements, we develop those based on uh, best information out there. Um, for intersection improvements, uh, we a lot of those came from the city and the county CIPs, um, and uh, you know we've communicated that with the cities, got some input. Um, so there's mu numerous CIP projects in, in, in the various agencies, um, so those are included. Um, and then for a rail service, um, bus services, also best practices, and some information that was available. 
In the end, for the engineering cost estimates, we use the, uh, it's known as the Caltrans 11 page preliminary cost estimate methodology. And really what it does is it takes quantities, you feed it into the spreadsheet, um, and those quantities relate to construction, bridges, and then there's various formulas that Caltrans has developed based on their experience to bring in all the soft costs, and that actually gave us then the, the ultimate bottom line numbers that we show you. So you use existing um, information that was out there from the various partners, the various transportation agencies in the county, which it sounds like you did plus Caltrans. Um, and was there any kind of massaging of that information or to sort of true it up to 2018 numbers to sort of make it as, I understand this is a 50,000 foot level planning document for purposes of general decision making. And I understand that this is not project level um, numbers. So I, just recognizing that, it is relatively important for us to understand the relative costs of these choices. Yes. So did you do anything to sort of true it up to current numbers? Absolutely, current absolutely. Current so the, 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 probably the biggest increases were all the estimates that came in on the, rail, on, on the trail, um, you know, for, for the segments that is out currently for bid. Um, you know, that it was like every once in a while, we, oh, new bids are in, let's update it. Um, the engineer, engineering news record um, uh, determines um, index numbers for increases in construction cost estimates, um, and they're, they're available online. You, anybody can find them. It averages here between 3.5 and 5 percent per annum. So any cost that had a base year of like 2015, we would look at the engineering news rec record um, indices and uh, bring it um, up to, to a base year um, analysis. So it, all the costs are presented in the same year. Great, thank you. And then um, on page 156 and again on 160, you've listed $41 million for the cost to reverse policy of the use of the rail corridor. And I wondered if someone on staff or your consultant team could walk us through what that 40, what is, what is that number? What does that represent? If I could just add to the question that you had previously, Commissioner Johnson, uh, Metro, we worked very closely with Metro to come up with the cost information for any transit improvements that were increased too. So all of the transit imp improvements, additional routes, frequencies, et cetera, and cost information was very much defined by Metro staff. Um, as far as your question on the um, additional costs, if there was a reversal of decision to not use the rail right away for passenger rail or for rail service, but to use it for either a trail only or a bus rapid transit, um, worked with um, Deputy Director Mendez, and the information that I have in my notes here is that um, there is about 29 million that would need to be repaid to the, um, between the California Transportation Commission as well as some of the STIP funds. Um, some of that, uh, the, you would need to look at the escalated amount of funds. There was originally 11 million that was um, funded by the California Transportation Commission, but if we ne wouldn't need to pay back those funds, it would e be escalated for current dollars. Um, there's also about $10.5 million from the f uh, Central Federal Lands for the North Coast project that we would not get if it was not constructed by 2020. Um, and the time frame for making that uh, change in policy and direction would um, not meet that deadline. And then also some staff time was added in there. I believe it's on the order of one and a half million to go through and, and um, work with the different agencies that would require that reversal. Yeah, I'm a little confused and maybe I've got it wrong. Um, so I'm gonna ask Luis to clarify, so it seems to me that in the past when I've asked this question, I thought I remember it correctly, but I'm a person of a certain age, so maybe I didn't. Um, so for a Prop 116 money, um, is it not correct that our current excursion use, passenger use along the rail line from Roaring Camp to Santa Cruz and the, and the annual holiday train, does that not, whatever we do irrespective of the rest of the rail quarter, does that not satisfy our Prop 116 obligation? Um, and that we don't have to pay it back? Uh, it, I mean, it, it's hard to say exactly what will make you know, satisfy the, the California Transportation Commission at any point, in, at any one particular point in time, because uh, depending on who is on the California Transportation Commission, their interpretation can change about things. Uh, now, based on questions that we have, we have asked in the past, um, we did ask uh, whether just the existing service uh, from Big Trees that goes from Felton to um, um, 
the boardwalk, whether that would be sufficient to qualify uh, for the Prop 116 funds, we were told no, that that would not be it. Uh, then when we talked about having some additional excursion service, and they said, yes, the additional ex excursion service could um, qualify, uh, and so that's why the commission then submitted an application uh, to implement additional excursion service, and that's how the, the commission was able to get, get approval for the uh, Prop 116 money, as, as well as state STIP, uh, uh, other transit money, STIP transit money as well. Um, and you know, depending on who you talk to, a transportation co commission, then s some people might say, okay, well that may be fine, but only for that section in which you are actually implementing some sort of excursion service. If you're not using the entire line for the excursion service, then maybe you should pay back you know, some of the, some of that money uh, because you're not using the entire line. So, so it, it, it can be up to the interpretation of whoever happens to be at the California Transportation Commission at that particular point in time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this side? <laughs> Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, uh, I have a question about process. Um, I know the city of Scotts Valley, we have consultants that are helping us with our theater group and that consulting team met with every city council member uh, to ask about what their perspective on things were. Um, I never got a call from anybody, and, I, and this is more of a, a Jacques Bertrand kind of question because he was always interested in the process. Who are you talking to, or who did you talk to? Did you talk to commissioners on a regular basis, just the chair, just uh, staff members? Because um, I'm, I'm trying to get a feeling for what kind of input did you get in terms of guiding this process? Because you came up with four scenarios, but at the same time, um, if I'm, my colleague here had mentioned, there may be an opportunity for different scenarios. You, you decided on these four as a combination, but it's kind of like building your own pizza, right? Um, sometimes you want this, that, and the other thing on it, but you guys decided that we're going to just go with these scenarios with these ingredients. And I'm wondering, if you didn't talk to lots of the commissioners, why didn't you? Commissioner, could I respond to that? And then, and I'll, then I'll ask uh, maybe Ginger to, to also step up. Well, I'm um, actually asking the consultants, if that's okay. Well, but I, I think I have a relevant piece of that, and that is that we have been talking to you throughout the whole process, and that the four scenarios were approved by this commission um, early last year, is that correct? So, I mean, it's not like we've been doing this in a vacuum, and we did uh, do, you know, a lot of extensive outreach with the public as well very early on with some online surveys and some workshops and so on, but um, I'll let the uh, consultant uh, answer your question. So as, as mentioned in the step one process, um, there was extensive outreach, uh, two public workshops um, held at Live Oak and the other one in Watsonville, evening workshops. We had a full day session with uh, specific stakeholders. Um, those would include a couple of interest groups, um, um, staff from RTC side on the economic um, evaluation reached out to every city, um, had lots of discussions about those, um, getting information for the economic analysis. Um, once we had the scenarios selected, which was approved by the board, it was in December last year, then that was our sort of you know, getting out the gates and run the analysis with these. So we were then tasked to come back to you to, to at this point where we are now to prove, to show the results, um, you know, and then see how we could refine those into a preferred alternative. Yeah, but it's, it's been my experience though. It's one thing to kind of come out of the gates, but it's another thing to kind of have markers where you, you make sure that you're on the right track. And sometimes uh, the way to do that is to have, uh, be consultive and uh, ha get feedback from uh, interested parties as, uh, as far as representatives are concerned. Hey, am I on the right track here? Are we doing the right thing? Um, and, and I think that's really important and I, I didn't really sense it from you all. Uh, Commissioner Schiffman. Yeah, I think it's important to remember the context in which this study is being done. I mean, there's tremendous divisiveness in the community about a couple of these alternatives. 
Um, the consultants never talked to me, and I'm glad they never talked to me, because there are already many members of the public who believe that commissioners on one side or the other have already made up their mind, and the study is just a sham. So I think it was very important that the consultants acted independently based on the scenarios that this commission approved. And the idea that somehow they should have been meeting with commissioners, I would be very concerned about that, and I think many members of the public would be concerned about that because what we wanted was an independent analysis. And an independent am analysis doesn't mean that you ask people along the way whether they like what you're doing. What it means is that you wait until it comes out and then you get mad. Um, you don't try to influence, influence <laughs> it along the way. And I think that's, at least from what I know, that's what's gone on here. We, uh, the commission approved a set of scenarios they're not exactly what I would love, but those are the scenarios that they approved. We now have a report with uh, an excess of information about all of those scenarios that we're, and the public are gonna be evaluating. I think the process has been a very, from what I know, the process has been a very clean one. The consultants have done what they were asked to do, which was take the, uh, the public information, the commission direct direction from phase one and do a phase two. We now have phase two and we're gonna get more, uh, I'm sure we're gonna get lots more information from the public, and then the commission's gonna have to make a decision. And I, my sense is that the process has been uh, a good process in terms of trying to maneuver through a very divisive, uh, controversial uh, situation to come up with uh, an outcome that has as much credibility as it possibly can. So. Um, I, I, I'm glad that there has not been uh, individual meetings, assuming that there haven't been individual meetings with commissioners along the way. I, I don't want to open this up into a debate of the commissioners. It's my recollection that we chose these scenarios and we voted on them. And I'd really like to open it up to the public to hear them. So is there any more questions? Real quick, Mr. Commissioner Bertrand. Yeah, I'd like to reiterate what uh, Commissioner Mulhern said about interacting with our new executive director, who he or she might be, and giving that individual time to make sure they're on board and understand the development that led into this. And also, there's probably going to be that person's imprint, because after all, they're going to be running this organization, hopefully many years into the future. Um, I haven't made up my mind one way or the other which, which scenario is going to be the best. And so I'd like to say that to people. My interest here in this study is it gives me a very clear vehicle or instrument to understand what actually will be the best for Santa Cruz, i.e. the scenarios, which ones are gonna be the best. So I just heard something interesting a little bit, and if I may ask Ginger to come back. Um, there was a mention that the different scenarios could be regrouped, I mean, depending on how we saw the results. I wanna get a better understanding of that. And also I'd like to know if that is the case, how would that affect the proposed timeline at this point? Temporarily, not decided completely, but how would you see that working out for this commission? Well, let me clarify a little bit. I'm, I'm certainly not asking to redo for other scenarios and, and um, lengthen this process any further, but the commissioners here are the decision makers. If you see that things need to be adjusted, um, but I, I feel like the information that we have in the report is the analysis that we can provide. Obviously, it's a draft. Um, some additional um, adjustments can be made to make some considerations, but we, uh, this is the scope of work that has the consultants have done. So, but the, given that you are the decision makers, if you feel like there needs, we, the preferred scenario would end up being a slightly different combination from what's presented before you today then that's your decision. Thank you, that was a great answer. Um, also in terms of Patrick's comments about including uh, progressive in terms of uh, commercial activity, um, presumably they might be taking trucks off the road and so I think his comment was well placed. Commissioner Coffin Gomez. Yes, certainly I will not attest to being a, a planner and to get information based on planners' synopsis of things um, it takes a lot from my mind to sort of wrap around of what this means and how to interpret it and how to relay it, or, or things about um, 
other scenarios or the way that the methodology and the reports are done, it's like 22% or ADA, how does that affect this and the different model, uh, different options that are here? Um, the seniors, the disadvantage, I, I, I think I would like to know a little bit more about how that plays out with this particular um, result of this, this uh, analysis work. Um, so I, I have some questions about that. And the, the um, and again, I don't even have my questions all, all laid out until I can digest this better. So I certainly know I need more time. Um, I would like to have a little bit of uh, questions answered about the modalities we don't currently use. I mean, how, how do we come up with numbers on expanding bus? How do we come up with numbers on how many would use the rail? Can we talk a little bit more about um, things that we don't currently use and how those numbers came and were developed? Mike Schmidt, Kimley Horn and Associates. You asked actually two questions that I'd, I'll probably address. Is one you asked about how we did the rail forecast. And that actually, what we did is we pivoted off the work that was previously done for the 2015 rail feasibility study, which relied on what's called a, uh, a direct ridership model, which basically is fancy speak for Farron Pierce took the uh, origin destination information from the travel demand model as well as a lot of information about the built environment um, and compared that to known um, riderships in different areas throughout the state and they use that as the basis for t developing a forecast. So we took that data and incorporated that into our study. Um, the other part of it is you've asked about, it, which is really the transit, which is the bus and the uh, BRT, we use the travel demand model to develop those forecasts. So that takes into consideration um, socioeconomic considerations, um, network considerations, future growth, a lot of aspects like that to help develop a forecast. And um, the, the other question I have, and, and I know we have a lot going on, so this is the one that I, it has to do with money, and I, I think that um, we have some commissioners that will probably be also responsive. How, how does this tell us about how we're leveraging the money we have available? I mean, can we, how do we get five to, five to one on our Measure D to help this project along with whatever scenarios come out of it? How, how do we tell the public how we're going to leverage the money the best way possible? I, it's, maybe it's a broad question, but um, I, I, when it comes to money and projects, everybody's gonna say this is too costly. How do we justify where our costs are going? And, and I, I think that we have to have those, that kind of conversation. Uh, for the public investment performance measure, what we did is we looked at the forecasts that were conducted through the regional transportation plan, which goes to 2040, and we scaled those back for the time period covered in this project. Um, then we also looked to see what new information was out there. What did the SB guideline, SB1 guidelines tell us about the competitive programs, at the, about the formula-based programs? Also, we look to see if there's been any changes in trends in terms of grant awards, what's been coming to Santa Cruz County, and we updated the re RTP revenues based on that. We also looked at any new programs that had come online that were not considered in the regional transportation plan and assumed those revenues. And then in the table that looks at the perform, uh, public investment, we looked at how those could be distributed by project based on project eligibility. So whether it's the geography, if they're in a particular location in our county or by mode is usually one of the most significant um, factors in being eligible for a grant source or also by outcome. I did, we did not do an analysis of how Measure D would leverage those funds. The Measure D funds that are included in this analysis are those identified for the trail and a small portion of the funding that's allocated to local jurisdictions for um, neighborhood projects. And in reverse of that, um, the consequences if, if Proposition 6 is passed, what, I don't see anything in here about how this outcome will change if that were to occur. It would be very significant. Um, we estimated that approximately 40% of the funding that we anticipate um, to be available for UCS uh, scenario, projects in UCS scenarios would go away. And so our, our public investment performance for measure would be significantly impacted. Thank you. Six. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and we're gonna open it up to the public. Um, and uh, yeah, show of hands of how many people would like to speak. Quite a few, okay, we're gonna do uh, two minutes. I just wanna hope I can maintain a quorum here, so come on up and uh, remember that it's just out, but I'd love to hear your comments. Uh, hello, my name is 
set. My name is Will Mensheen. I'm a uh, resident of Santa Cruz and a longtime uh, member of the Bicycle Advisory Committee. The RTC's Bicycle Advisory Committee is an alternate and a voting member over the years. Um, my, uh, first off, I'd like to appreciate and recognize the work that staff has done. Uh, it's an incredible amount of work and consultants as well. Getting your arms around all this information is no easy task, and I think that um, the analogy that comes to mind is a little bit like lowering water in a reservoir, you know, that you can start to see where the rocks are. And I think that that's very important that we recognize that there are rocks. There are some that were possibly known all along and some that may have never been uh, exposed by the, you know, or off the radar, so to speak. To me, the most important um, omission that in this study is the fact, or, or distinction, is that the, con the uh, comparison between a trail-only design and a rail-with-trail design ends up producing numbers that are almost identical in every sense. I mean, in, they're virtually in the noise uh, when you talk about an analysis. But fundamentally, it's um, not accurate that the trail-only approach uh, is as represented in this study. If you use the um, vision that uh, Greenway has had and Trail Now has had for the idea of a linear park with a wide general purpose, multimodal transportation uh, system, essentially that consists of a wide paved path and a separated pedestrian walkway that would be ADA compliant, that's substantially different than what is represented here. And so therefore those differences ripple through this entire study and in effect make much of this data irrelevant or inaccurate. The second, the second most important thing I believe is that of all of the uh, scenario A groupings with the highway expenditures, there's no attempt to leverage the expense of all that infrastructure. Approximately 85% of the cost of that highway infrastructure is over crossings and bridges. And there was no attempt at all to include our uh, bus rapid transit or the expense of those bridges being leveraged for future multi, uh, excuse me, for uh, dedicated Thank transit. Thank you very lines. much, sir. Thank you. My name's Kerry Pico. I will also say I was not prepared to see that if you add a lane to your highway, your speed actually slows down. And so I, what I wanna say is I don't wanna blame these guys, but if there's garbage in, you get garbage out. So something else that came out in this study, and obviously nobody's read it all and digested it all, but the cost of a trail only is $5.7 million per mile. Compare that to what's used in the MBSST, which is one point one, uh, less than $1 million per mile. And then you add the, the bridges and all that stuff. But the point is, the numbers are all over the place. They're irrelevant. In fact, we calculated how much per square foot, if you account for the width and all that stuff, the cost for a trail only costs more than a trail with rail, just the trail component. And yet, it's a much simpler job. So if you're not gonna do things fairly, nobody's gonna believe you guys in any of this stuff. This is such a biased set of information going in and nothing can be trusted. And, and if I, I offer all my information, but I'm just telling you, you, you guys lost it. You just don't have any trust. And that's the problem. And I don't care how it comes out, but if you do it honestly and fairly, I don't care if it's rail, trail, highway, whatever. I just want it to be fair, honest, and responsible. And I don't see that. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Bruce Sawhill. Uh, hello, Chair, Commissioners. Um, I'm a board member of Friends of the Rail and Trail and also an ex-Cycle uh, Committee member of the RTC. And so I have a question actually for the consultants, and that is when you, I've done some travel demand modeling in my life, and so I wanted to ask if the travel demand model includes synergies. An example would be at this new smart rail system in Marin and Sonoma, at the point they had had 700,000 riders, they had carried 60,000 bikes. And uh, this is pretty amazing, and wondering if effects like this were also considered. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Casey Byer from the Santa Cruz Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, one, I wanna compliment uh, the staff that's been working on this for over three plus years since Measure D, and also your consultants who are also diligently working on this. There was a comment made that this is a rush to judgment. 
I've been in 23 of the RTC meetings over the last two years on this subject matter alone. Each meeting is usually one or two hours long. There's a dialogue and conversation about what's going on locally, how it fits into the region for here, and what's the best use of all of the rail trails. Uh, I don't like everything in this, in this project, and I don't think anybody in the room does. But it, the end answer is what's the best use for the community. And I think this, pro this uh, consultant project arrives at those solutions that give you the opportunity to make those decisions. Don't let anybody fool you that you're not doing your job, which you are. I'm on many planning commissions myself, and it's a very difficult challenge to let the consultants do their work, then to present you a document, then you do your job in bringing it back to the public. There will be uh, public comment meetings, uh, uh, workshops going forward, and I think one of your commissioners mentioned that there's a deadline date. That deadline date is a subject matter date. It gives you an opportunity to work to that, and obviously in planning processes, you can extend the date based upon the information you receive from the consultants, from the community, from the public, and your own uh, in-depth education on the document. So again, thank you for what you do for the community. I appreciate all the hard work and the work ahead. Thank you. Uh, Michael Saint, uh, I'm here basically as a citizen and a taxpayer, not as CFST, and I wanna just say I have a lot of respect for all you do, and especially the staff members. A lot of work went into this. Uh, our group went over this study on Tuesday. My initial impression, and actually the impression of the group, uh, was no matter what scenario you chose, uh, not much of any better uh, happened than the no-build scenario. Uh, and as a taxpayer, I would say it's spending almost three quarters of a billion dollars and not vastly improving on the no build scenario is somewhat financially irresponsible. But in fairness, and with my respect for this group and all the money put in and time, uh, I'm gonna be one of the first public members to select a scenario. Um, basically, I have spent time on this and my choice personally is scenario B and with a change of two areas and an addition of another one. Um, eliminating the um, ramp metering, unless it's for bus rapid transit only, would be suggested. Uh, widen Mission Street intersection, um, check that off the list, and the excursion rail. By doing this, you save $138 million on that scenario, bringing the cost down to $694 million. And those are the things that that does by those changes. Uh, you get all high marks on economic, economic benefits. It's cheapest by 56 million, allows passenger rail service. Scenario B is the safest, transport speeds the same, highest transit usage, less public investment needed, funding for the costs and maintenance uh, from outside sources is highest. Uh, you also have a lowest available collision cost for scenario B. VMT is a wash except for higher transit VMT, which is a good thing. And you also have a lowest pollutant uh, for, for item B. Good luck on all everything you do and I'll see you in the next meeting. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, I was all set to say good morning. Um, I'm Brett Garrett, uh, thank you for this report. I've spent a lot of time going through the details. I, I find myself reverse engineering, trying to break it down by project and figure out where the numbers came from. So if that raw data exists, um, it would be helpful to provide it. Um, I do encourage you to think outside the box and above the ground. Um, I do feel like a scenario is missing that should be studied. I advocate for an elevated pod car system, personal rapid transit. Um, and in a way, I feel like this study also advocates personal rapid transit because when I try to put together a personal rapid transit scenario, it ends up being cheaper than any of the scenarios. And when I go through the goals, it seems to me that my scenario meets every single goal better than any of the scenarios. I'm just kind of astonished that that's that's how I read it, and I ho hope I'll have a chance to talk to many of you individually about some of these issues and bring in someone that's actually working on a PRCT system and building a prototype and can actually speak for why it's feasible and why it's why you're going to see it existing in the next couple of years. Um, and I did put together a scenario that I I handed to all of you, um, but you should have received it. I hope. 
Um, and yeah, I was gonna read, but I guess I've said what I need to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Buzz Anderson. Uh, imagine the RTC as a group of physicians with the patient being the transportation problems we find ourselves in. As in the medical field, your first responsibility is to do no harm. The most harmful thing you can do is to misspend the taxpayer's money. For as you all know, every dollar spent unwisely is a dollar taken away from more needy alternative projects and programs. Spending funds on a train that will never come to fruition is a disservice to the public. There are better uses for the hundreds of millions of dollars needed to realize a light rail system that studies have shown will not alleviate congestion. It would be much wiser to invest in a wide paved thoroughfare that would be much less expensive to build and maintain and could be used for zero emission technology advanced modes of transportation. At the very least, when physicians are faced with a difficult case, they seek a second opinion. And who better to offer a second opinion than the citizens of Santa Cruz County, of which you represent? Let's work together to get the important decision on what to do with the rail corridor in the hands of the voters. A trail only or a rail trail solution should be advanced as a ballot initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jessica Evans. Um, so since the 1950s, America has been engaged in road and transit planning that was designed to reduce congestion. That was the goal, the only goal. And I think that we have found that the evidence on the ground shows us that that goal, it doesn't work. So we need to take congestion reduction and just set it aside because it's not an equitable or useful way to do our transportation planning. So I encourage um, the commission to look at scenario B, obviously. It came out ahead on all these different measures. I also encourage you to look at, um, you know, adding in freight to Watsonville, which we obviously need to have freight to Watsonville because we have businesses in Watsonville that need freight. So that should be at a minimum be added, um, and I think that it's reasonable to um, see whether we can do some time shifting and, and you know have freight running all the way into Santa Cruz if Progressive finds that they have customers in Santa Cruz, maybe they can run freight trains at night. I know that this is something that works even if we just have like little electric trolleys. Anyways, um, I do like Measure B. It's 21.1% total for miles, bike to transit, and walk combined. That's the highest percentage of any of these scenarios. And I encourage you to have fun with your reading. I know I'm going to be digging in. <laughs> Thank Thanks. Uh, first of all, I want to I thank the, every commissioner, every single one of you. I trust your integrity. Uh, I, I'm impressed with the work that you do, and I know it's super hard. This is such a big decision. This is like the next hundred years of, of choices that people are going to have, people that are, un, you know, as yet unborn, right? Um, I would remind everyone, uh, and I'm sure you're mindful of regional transportation plans everywhere. Uh, Vision 2040, the state plans and so forth that emphasize uh, active transportation and transit over vehicles. So I was delighted to see uh, the, uh, the results, uh, spent some time on this weekend of uh, scenario B, and I would agree with Jessica that freight should be retained for uh, Watsonville, but we saw in the slideshow today the fewest number of collisions, the lowest cost of collisions, all of these in, in uh, scenario B. Uh, transit mode share is the highest, bike mode share is the highest, lowest vehicle miles traveled, lowest greenhouse gas emissions, uh, more funding available, the highest tax revenue, and the economic vitality uh, measures all high uh, up and down the, the, uh, the column. It's also the second least costly. And the, the last thing I'd add, I took uh, page 165 of a section on person trips by screen line and mode where you take the three corridors and you have these 
these uh, some number of nine screen lines and you count the number of people who pass through these by mode uh, to compare just scenario A trail only with scenario B, the number of bicycles that collectively pass through these points is 5686, 5686 for scenario A. Scenario B has 7,761. For transit riders passing through those points, 5688 and then 17,557 transit users. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Thanks. Hi, uh, Jack Nelson, and I'm speaking now uh, for the Campaign for Sensible Transportation. And I can't say much in two minutes, but I do have a two-page letter here that I'll ask your staff to circulate to you and your staff and uh, consultants. Um, one thing that uh, we've noticed in looking at this study is that uh, there's a baseline assumption that auxiliary lanes will be built before this analysis even begins. And then three out of four of these scenarios have yet additional auxiliary lanes uh, added on top of that. So how do we see an eco-green scenario here that isn't so heavily still autocentric? Could we have an even less autocentric uh, scenario than any of these and find out through the model process what that does? What if, what if it turned out that's, that's, the, uh, that's the winning ticket to a sustainable future is to stop being as autocentric as these plans are? Uh, two words that I would hope would uh, stick with you as a question mark. Uh, the two words are induced travel. And um, induced travel was not addressed in the Highway 1 draft EIR that's still out there, still somewhere to be finished. Um, and the state of California has weighed in on induced travel. Uh, it passed Senate Bill 743 on transportation impacts. And the Office of Planning and Research has issued a technical advisory on evaluating transportation impacts in CEQA. That's dated April 2018. And it says uh, agencies consider induced travel. What is induced travel? It's when you widen a freeway and people start using it more and you lose the benefit you're aiming for and you may actually make things worse or not get very far for all the money you've spent. So uh, I would hope you would all, all would look at that. Whoops. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. And I'll pass my letter over to your staff. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Piet Cannon from Ecology Action. I want to thanks, thank the uh, team for producing this data-rich document. Um, there's a lot to go through in terms of what, what transportation looks like now, what it looks like in the future. Um, I did want to comment one thing in terms of, or a question was, it didn't seem like the bicycle um, shares change very much over the different scenarios. And I was wondering if the team considered things like the recent jump bike bike shares in the city of Santa Cruz, because those numbers are, are pretty high. If they also looked at things like Arana Gulch, the city takes numbers on that, because that's a new bicycle facility that you know is similar to a, a rail trail that would be built you know throughout the county in terms of the impact of the numbers. And also to look at data in terms of electric bike usage and, and the increase of, of um, that mode of transportation in terms of how that might impact increase increase bike ridership. One, one of the um, statewide documents of this um, United Court, the Unified Corridor study references the Caltrans goals of tripling bike um, ridership um, in, in short order. So, and also doubling transit trips and doubling pedestrian trips. So, you know, hopefully when you look through all this data and you look for solutions, you know, we can look at those active transportations and transit as some of the things that we want to invest in. So, thank you. Thank you. I would like to echo the thank you to staff for all of the hard work that it went into this report. And I do agree that there are some good tools in here to work with. However, I'm um, in with many other people concerned about the contrived nature of the scenarios. Um, Santa Cruz doesn't like change. We all know that. Uh, in 2016, when 17 washed out, people joked that, hey, I don't mind waiting three hours to commute over the hill, as long as we don't make it easy for people who live over there or who work over there to live over here. So I think we actually really need to start by asking ourselves a very difficult question. Do we truly want to alleviate gridlock? 
and make a more equitable transportation system for our county? If the answer to that question is yes, then perhaps we should be having this conversation, at least the highway portion, with Santa Clara County, since at least half of our commuters are heading that direction. This, one of the things that this study does is, is it assumes zero funding for HOV lanes. Now, I'm not advocating for that, and quite honestly, I don't like that my Greenway scenario has been tied to that, because that kind of cooks the books, really. But I don't know that we can say there's no funding available for that option. Um, Con Commissioner Schifrin talked about an independent analysis. Relying on past RTC studies um, and putting perhaps too much, getting perhaps too much input, although we do appreciate the input from our staff, getting too much input from our staff who repeatedly publicly states a desire for one particular outcome is not the way to get an independent analysis. Uh, what if we compared ourselves to places that are doing things better than us, like Davis and Boulder, both of which are platinum bike cities with bus systems that work much better than ours, or places like Copenhagen that have evolved beyond the car invasion to become people-centered places, communities that are friendly to people of all ages and abilities. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNulty. Hello, my name is Tina Andrietta. Um, I just want to reiterate, don't forget the poor, don't forget the people in South County that are not represented here. <laughs> They're working, they commute from Watsonville here. Um, they have to carpool, a lot of them don't have a lot of money. Don't forget the disabled. Don't forget um, people that cannot, uh, that, that are not really here. I'm looking around and everybody's looks like me, middle class and white or upper middle class. And I wanna say that we need a, a rail with the trail. I bicycle, but I also know the importance of a rail. A, I, I go over the hill, I take the train from Santa Cruz, I mean, sorry, from uh, I go all the way up to Oakland and Berkeley. I get off, I go off to the concerts. I go with friends, we live in Oakland. We take the train and rail into San Francisco. Um, I did, recently I did the, um, my friend lives down in um, Ontario. We took it into downtown LA for the March in Science. My God, it was great passing all the cars on the freeway and on the roads. We need a rail. We can have it low enough where, where people with walkers can get on it, people with bicycles, women with strollers, grandmothers with strollers, people with uh, wheelchairs. And I'm just asking you for people who are legally blind, um, and I know a lot of people who will not ride uh, their bikes to work. You know, some people will, some people won't, and I think a lot will not. So please, conti please consider the rail in your decision along with a bike and walking trail. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just for clarification, I, I've sat on almost every committee in this county, and, and this commission has the best representation of any committee. There's one supervisor from every district, and there's a representative from every city. Go ahead, Mr. Mark. Good afternoon, Chair Botroff and fellow commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a professional civil engineer, and I'm the chair of the Friends of the Rail and Trail. Uh, congratulations to all of you and your staff. This is a, a monumental piece of work. Uh, it looks pretty darn good at, at first glance. I've spent the last week uh, reading through it. Uh, it looks great. Um, as the friends of the rail and trail, we are not surprised that scenario B comes out the clear winner. Uh, many people have mentioned some of the uh, clear advantages. I'll remind you of a few that struck me as particularly important. One is safety. With 118 fewer collisions than most of the other scenarios, that's about one less collision every three days. Pretty significant, uh, not to mention the money we're saving. The environment, by far, the uh, reduction in vehicle miles traveled, something like 230,000 vehicle miles traveled per day. That's about 94 million per year. When you think about carbon uh, reduction, CO2 reduction, that's like a forest. You know, we're, we'd be planting a forest. Um, the highest uh, number of uh, uh, bike share, you know, uh, no surprise to us, when you combine uh, multimodal transit systems, you see an increase in bike ridership. That's what this study reflects. Uh, and of course, the higher use of public transit. 
the one thing that I did notice that didn't seem like it was quite up to snuff was the, the state rail plan. Doesn't seem like it got a, a fair shake. Uh, and I, I can understand that because it was a draft and now it's final. It was final to about two or three weeks ago. Uh, but that state rail plan is really important. It uh, targets $1.5 billion for rail transit improvements in the Central Coast and there's only three projects in there. So uh, there'd be a lot of money available. Also, it clearly states that the state's moving from highway expansion to railway expansion. And lastly, as you heard Kyle Gradinger, it's really a vision for creating, uh, turning California into the Switzerland of North America. And we have a rail line and we ought to be part of that, of that vision. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, hi, I'm Ryan Sarnataro. I'm a bike rider in the county. Um, use, it, use the bike a lot more in the car whenever I can. Um, the question came up as to who the consultants were talking to, uh, where were they getting their uh, direction from, and if it wasn't from the commissioners, then it was from the staff, and the staff has a very particular bias in this situation. Uh, I, I notice in this document that, that the first thing that comes up is widening of pathway on San Lorenzo River Trestle approved. Now, if you're gonna take the rails out, you don't need to do that. You don't need to spend that money. The fact that this is at the top indicates the level of bias that went into the, the direction that the consultants were given. And so I'm, I'm concerned that there was very good data that was provided. Uh, Greenway had a, had a study made that included the synergies and the increases in use that would happen if you have a wide separated trail. And that option really didn't get a proper vetting in this situation. And so how can you go forward with uh, one of these other scenarios that spends hundreds of millions of dollars on rail when you really didn't understand or don't have a, a complete accounting for what would happen if you had a proper trail. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we'll go ahead and close the public comment and uh, bring it back. I don't know if there's any comments at this point. Uh, commissioners, a comment, or do we all just want to do our homework and uh, study? Comments? Well, this is coming back on the TPW meeting, right? So. I yeah, we're going to bring this back as a priority. I, I think we're okay with that and uh, have a big conversation then. Questions down here? Comments? Mr. Johnson. So I want to get back to the, the whole concept of where we can agree on facts. So what I'm hearing is as much as people want to uh, embrace a scenario, embrace uh, a study, at the same time, uh, there are differing facts and differ, differ, differing uh, approaches to things like a full uh, tr trail, the amount of uh, savings on this scenario or uh, this uh, data that was uh, inputted. So how do we get there? I mean, uh, you know, Bud, Bud mentioned, you know, one of, the, one of the real problems that we're having as a, both a commission and maybe even a community is that nobody can agree on the facts. And I don't know if this, uh, if this deserves a, uh, a peer review to some degree so we can kind of tighten up. You know, on the one hand, it's a repayment of uh, 116 funds goes from 10 million or 11 million dollars to 28 million, okay? If you can't agree on that, then how are we gonna make a decision based on, quote, the facts? So uh, I'm not saying that right now we vote on whether or not we should have a peer review, but at the same time, I, I know for much smaller projects, and we're talking about $1.2 billion as a possibility, sometimes you have to revisit and make sure that the facts presented by these very capable people, I mean, we're using uh, uh, this particular group for our um, a study in, in Scotts Valley. I respect them, but at the same time, we have a, a, a serious issue with coming together on, uh, on what the real facts are. And when we, when we agree on those, we enhance our, the opportunity for us to agree on a solution for this, for this, um, for this corridor and for the uh, transportation needs of our community. Thank you. Mr. Shepherd. I think it's important to clarify that we're really not talking about facts. 
because we're projecting into the future and we don't know what the future is going to be. So when these studies are done, they're based on certain assumptions. Even knowing what's going on now is tricky and we can have disagreements about what our current reality is. We have disagreements about what our past reality was. And oftentimes what we think of as facts represent our values and the assumptions we make based on our values. To the extent that the commissioners believe that at the end of this process we're gonna have a community consensus, um, I, I, I just wonder where they've been for the last three years because that's not going to happen. There are basic differences in, in values that are going on here. And we have a study that's trying to project based on the best information that's available statistically what that future might look like under different conditions. And if you have other assumptions, you're going to get the other you're going to get the other uh, projections. And, you know, there's no, nothing happening here today is a surprise to me. The people who just want to trail only are not going to be happy with any, fa any projections that show that an alternative to the trail only is going to be better than the trail only. And the people who want the rail trail are not going to be happy if the study had come out and showed that a trail only was going to be better. We're, what we asked for, and I think what we've got, was uh, a report that's based on the information that's available statistically that can be used, that's credible to uh, what I think is an ind as independent a consultant as we're going to be able to get. And to think that we're going to be able to resolve all this through peer review or subcommittees or whatever is, um, I just think, deluding ourselves. Ultimately, the commission's going to have to evaluate this material, get more information to the extent that it's needed, and then make a, a decision that some people are going to like and some people are not going to like because there's just a fundamental difference of opinion about what should be done with the corridor. And um, I don't think there's any way uh, to avoid that. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm just going to wrap it up with, uh, you know, I, I think what we've got is a great document in front of us. I believe that the people that created this document uh, have interjected everything into it to make it as accurate as possible. If as a commissioner you read this document and you see something here that doesn't make sense to you, doesn't seem accurate, I encourage you to contact staff and to ask a question. And uh, at the end, we're going to be voting on what we, as Commissioner Schiffrin said, what we best believe moves this county forward. Uh, I don't want to get hung up in the numbers. You know, we all know what it costs to buy the trail, uh, but we all know that, that it isn't just paying back that exact number. So it, it, it's a range, and a lot of this stuff is a range. And as we've all learned in construction, some projects may seem like they cost a certain amount, and, mo and most likely they're going to cost more. So I think everybody should just take that into their consideration when they look at this document. And I think what we need, really need to do is just take the time to evaluate it, con continue the discussions and the dialogue, and we're going to get to that process, whether it be in December or January, or whether we have a new director on board, we're going to get to this decision sooner or later. So thank you all for your participation. Moves on to our next item, which is the uh, Cruise 511 program update. Uh, Anise, welcome. And I do have a PowerPoint for this presentation. Thank you. Two, three, four, five, six. We're good? We're good. Six. Yeah, we just, we just need to get a quorum. Oh, yeah, we need seven for a quorum, but this is an information item. Then we're good. We're good? Well, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, well, that's getting loaded. I'll go ahead and start. Um, so my name is Ani Shank. I'm a transportation planner with the RTC. I've been here for about a year now, and um, I will try to keep this short. I know we've all had a long morning or afternoon. Um, so I'll just give you a brief review of what the Cruise 501 program is. Uh, it's a travel, primarily a travel information program that provides services to uh, commuters, uh, residents, uh, whether you're in school here or tourists, you can find information on our website about uh, driving, biking, walking, carpooling, all modes possible. We also work with employers to develop customized programs for those employers. I'm just going to. 
um, that allow them to encourage their employees to get out of single occupancy vehicle mode shares and into carpooling or biking. Um, we also work with a number of agencies on these types of programs and messaging um, campaigns around safety, um, bike to work day, we participate in all those types of events and uh, have a number of partners that we work with to encourage uh, non-drive alone modes of transportation, Every, everything from nonprofits like Ecology Action to local jurisdictions. Um, as I said, I've been here for about a year now and have had the opportunity to think about some of the challenges that we face in transportation demand management, um, particularly in Santa Cruz County. And um, it's not surprisingly, these challenges are not unique to us. There are challenges that the profession faces across the, the country. Um, the first is that we have a diverse population in terms of need. We've just witnessed that this morning with all the conversation and dialogue. Um, if the result of not being proactive is that you can end up with ad hoc approaches to TDM. Uh, we also have many different stakeholders, um, and by stakeholders, I uh, mean all those agencies that we partner with. Um, and if we don't coordinate well with those stakeholders, then you can end up with very inconsistent messaging and approaches to trying to manage transportation demand. We also, and this is not unique to us again, um, have difficulty in measuring the impacts of our program, which means that it's hard to prove success. And um, I, the thing I wanna focus on the most in terms of our biggest challenge is that we have an increasing array of shared mobility options, um, not just here in Santa Cruz, but uh, throughout the country. And it's really hard to keep up with those. And we're also seeing uh, greater and greater uh, advances in technology. I'm not sure where I should point this. Oops, okay, that's clearly the wrong button. Yes, please. So the biggest change that we see coming online is um, related to autonomous vehicles. Uh, the future of our transportation is very, very different. Uh, we're going to see not just autonomous vehicles, but more electrification of our modes. And um, people are calling this a transportation disruption. It will fundamentally change how we move around. And this is probably the biggest change that we've seen since the introduction of the automobile. Now, um, one of the things that we'll see with automation is interconnectedness, vehicles communicating with other vehicles, vehicles communicating with our um, hard infrastructure, by that I mean lights and signals. Um, vehicles can even communicate with wearables, so a vehicle communicating with a pedestrian and their smartwatch. Uh, and then finally, and where, we, where I come in, is vehicles that communicate with planners. So providing data to planners behind the scenes so we can monitor and understand what's happening on our roadways. Again, I hit the wrong button, sorry. Um, and so with that, what I'd really like to emphasize is that data is actually going to become the new infrastructure. Uh, we are used to thinking of data as information that helps us make informed decisions, but it actually is a piece of infrastructure and it's becoming more so that way. Uh, we're gonna have to rely on it in ways that we can't even anticipate right now. Um, so that's one of the reasons why this is called the transportation disruption. It will change how we do planning. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of these plans, but there are several cities now that are developing plans um, just around the digital age. How do we manage mobility in the, this era of um, data as infrastructure? And it requires a rethinking of how we manage our infrastructure based on improving access to that data. A number of private sector companies are now on board with this. I don't know if you saw the news yesterday, or I think it was the day before, but Ford, Uber, and Lyft are all agreeing to openly share their data about uh, usage of their services. Okay, I'm not sure why that keeps getting, thank you. 
so the way that this has been talked about, uh, in addition to transportation disruption, is that it's a revolution. It's, there's three revolutions that we're seeing in uh, transportation, and um, those revolutions, again, are share, are automation, electrification, and sharing of transportation services. This could lead to a number of outcomes. Um, there's three represented on this slide. One is the business as usual, which we always consider. Um, the second um, is electrification and automation together without sharing, and what that will do, and you know, this slide actually is a bit dated. It shows um, a relatively stable number of vehicles on the road, but um, most people now agree that this will, the introduction of automation is going to increase um, vehicle trips. It's going to increase VMT. Uh, we're gonna see people who, which is a great thing, people who previously didn't have access to vehicles will now have access to them, increasing the, um, the trips in VMT. Uh, with sharing, we have the uh, possibility of really um, not only reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, but also dramatically decreasing the number of vehicles on the roadway, uh, roadways. So the way that this is being talked about is um, kind of a heaven and hell scenario and where are we gonna end up? Uh, we could end up in a health scenario if we don't manage our uh, infrastructure and really encourage sharing. We could end up in a heaven scenario which provides greater access and mobility to people of all ages and economic backgrounds if we encourage sharing. Can you advance it please to the next slide? So uh, Fair and Peers has uh, this chart that's very interesting up on their website. Uh, what they did is they tested a number of different uh, transportation models, travel demand models, looking at the possibility of what would happen with the introduction of automated vehicles. And um, they looked at both trip-based models and activity-based models and um, the more traditional limited sens sensitivity models. And one thing that's um, really striking is the change in vehicle trips. Again, this is the heaven and hell scenario comparison. If we do a good job at uh, really pushing shared uh, shared usage of our infrastructure, then we end up with potentially a reduction in vehicle trips. If we don't, we're going to see very substantial increases. Can you please go to the next slide? Thanks. And this slide is from the NACDO website. Um, and it, again, it just shows what our current existing business as usual scenario looks like in terms of a typical street section. Uh, cross-section and what it could look like if we have a future of shared mobility, which includes um, not just shared vehicles, but bicycle, bike share, um, shared transit, uh, which is already a shared mode. And um, we, you see a huge increase in the capacity of our roadway system. I'm not gonna go into all the details of how this will change land use, but this, is, this could really substantially change how we think about curb space and parking. I'm trying to use that. Nope. Okay. So where I'm going with this, in terms of how this relates to Cruise 511, is if we're going to get to the heaven scenario and sh encourage shared mobility, then we really need to update how we're approaching shared mobility. Um, we have seen a really rapid adoption of service mobility as a service platforms. It's kind of one of the new uh, tech lingos. Um, adopted from the tech sector where they talk about software as a service. Well, um, people more and more are starting to think of mobility as, as a service that we provide to customers. So that's sort of a mentality that's been adopted from the private sector and you, you see a lot more government agencies um, doing partnerships with the private sector in order to implement these types of platforms. There's two examples up on the screen. Uh, it's been shown to be very effective. You can, uh, if, if I'm a commuter or a trying to get to a ball game in San Mateo County, I can look at potential rideshare matches or how to get there by transit or walking or biking. 
and my choices are not just shown uh, in terms of mileage, but there's other um, ramifications of my choices that are shown on there, such as the CO2 emissions and the cost implications. So uh, we're trying to encourage that sharing. There's a, a large number of, peop of companies out there that are providing this service, um, and what the logos you see on the bottom of the screen there is just a small smattering of that. Thanks. This um, is just what I was able to put together in a couple of hours in terms of looking at the counties around the Central Coast who have implemented some level of this online uh, type of service. Um, you'll see a gap in Santa Cruz County. Our neighboring counties have been able to implement this. I think really think that in order to encourage more interregional um, transportation sharing, we should we should move towards this direction, this mobility service platform direction. So um, what would this look like in terms of uh, how we get there? So the first step would be to develop uh, policies that actually acknowledge the uh, disruption that we're going to see in transportation and encourage shared mobility. And then you get to practice and uh, this um, mobility as a service platform I was talking about is actually one element of what we would call the practice um, implementation of uh, the policies. And um, and then, you know, engagement, we do that already, we do a lot of that, um, but the difference here is again treating the transportation user as a customer, as a client, uh, and really figuring out what it is that is easy, reduces barriers to use, um, in including things like affordability and safety. And, um, and then finally, monitoring uh, these mobility as a service platforms allow us to monitor reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, trip reductions, um, and um, increases in non-drive alone mode share uh, options. So um, I'll close with that and just this is really just an update to let you know where, what I'm thinking and where we're going with the program. Uh, we will be applying for a grant um, in the, uh, the Sustainable Communities grant application that was just recently announced, um, called for projects. So yeah, I look forward to hearing more about that grant and also moving forward with the program. I'll take any questions if there are any from the commissioners. Any questions, Bernice? Commissioner Kaufman? Can you go back to the slide with the counties? please, that have okay. the blue and the green. Um, full service versus limited service, Are you? Wh what are you looking at there? Sure, yeah, basically limited service means um, ride share matching only. Um, and, and then the full service means that you can get everything from information on Waze carpool options to um, you know, your transit system. Some, uh, there's been some conversations about, uh, and I don't, I think some cities have been successful with this, not necessarily on the Central Coast, um, but having like a one payment system using this platform, that would obviously be a long-term goal. Um, and what that could look like is you would pay once and have one car, like a clipper card, but would, that would also be valid for bike share systems. And do we have a difference in cost factor or do we see what the investments are of the other counties on what they're? Pr That's a good question. I would, it would require me to look into that more and call those respective agencies. I, I'm sure we'll hear more about this as well. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm gonna go ahead and open to the public. Anybody from the public uh, have a question, comment? Thanks. Um, isn't it just stunning to watch all the people who believe they're very interested in our transportation future go pouring out of the room after the unified corridor study item was over, and then we have one of your transportation nerds getting up and talking to you about whole new pieces of the future that we need to be thinking about. Um, I'd, I'd like to express my own op opinion here. I approach these new technologies with interest and skepticism, aware that uh, technology always has a kind of front end sales job promoting what's great about it, and the downsides or the parts that might not actually work out tend to emerge later. So for instance, a lot of us believe that uh, Uber and Lyft are part of our transportation future, and yet, uh, one article I've just read lately that was published in American Prospect reveals that Uber, the more rides Uber 
gives, the more money it loses. So in, if I can s recite the statistics correctly from memory, in 2016, they lost $3 billion, and in 2017, they lost $4.5 billion. Uh, as soon as we have a major economic recession and investors lose heart, Uber could go bankrupt. So that's, you know, they haven't figured out actually how to have it make money yet. So uh, all, all of these um, possibilities I think are fascinating. I hope your commission will have your staff tell you more about this, bring this forward further in the future because it's, it's really part of what you should be looking at. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Ms. Strauss. Hello, Yannicka Strauss, Bikes Santa Cruz County. I just wanted to say I really like the direction that Cruise 511 is going. Um, as speaking as a millennial, um, at the future is multimodal. We want options and we use several of them to, um, to get where we want to go. So um, thank you, Anais, for bringing it this way. Thank you for your comments. Here, we'll go ahead and bring it back. That's a present. Oh, I'm sorry, come on up, man, sorry. Hi, Commission um, Tegan Spicer. I'm a alumni of the RTC. Um, I wanted to say, I just want to remind you that it was only three years ago that Cruise 511 and the RTC was able to bring all of the uh, TDM resources online in one place. Now, it isn't that we didn't have websites before, but the entire branding under Cruise 511 and the integration of all of the modes in one place was a very significant leap, and I just want to say that happened only three years ago. So I think this current um, presentation that Anais just presented you with the, the significant um, advancement and disruption that's happening with technology is, is a major challenge, uh, I think, going forward in terms of how you take what you've now got as a, as a great platform to the next level, and I really encourage you to continue uh, thinking creatively and continue to make investment in this really important uh, aspect of transportation, which is helping users really use the systems, the systems in both the private and public context that we have. It's very challenging, I think, for people to figure out um, where to go, and I think by centralizing uh, the resources under the Cruise 511 umbrella, whatever else you choose to enhance there, is a, is a really important um, step that you've already taken to help the public figure it out. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, now we'll bring it back. And uh, any other comments? Uh, just an oral report. Uh, so with that, we'll uh, adjourn, and our next meeting is on... I just thought of it um, on a, uh, when she was talking. Um, so is the platform, does it appear differently, for, uh, different for a visitor or for someone who lives here? Is there a different uh, way to approach it perhaps? Like a visitor might have different questions as opposed to someone who actually lives here. Yeah, they operate, um, you can be, you can use it one time. Uh, different platforms operate differently. So some platforms that I looked into, you register, when you register, you have to identify if this is a one-time trip or if this is a regular commute trip. Um, that seems a little clunky to me. Uh, this, the screenshot I had on, on the PowerPoint, um, what I was able to go without any registration and figure out what carpool matches would be, but I would then have to register to contact those people. Um, but I could still figure out transit or lift or biking options without actually being a registered user, so it varies. Yeah, yeah. And one of the goals is really to consolidate all the options that exist currently for carpool alone. You have Scoop, Duet, Waze Carpool, Uber, Car Uber Pool, Lyft Line, and there's just so many options out there that having them under one umbrella gives you the best chance to find a match. Okay, now we'll go ahead and uh, uh, adjourn until the next meeting will be the uh, RTC meeting on November 1st at 9 a.m. in Watsonville, and our TPW meeting, which we've now added the uh, Unified Quarter Study to, will be on Thursday, October 18th at 9, 9 a.m. Uh, in this chambers right here. And we're adjourned, thank you.